to stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. everybody for coming. Uh, first order of business this evening is going to be public comments. Uh, I'm going to preface uh, this by just letting people know that uh, public comments, we've got a five minute clock up on the wall that gets uh, reset whenever somebody new steps to the podium. Uh, we ask you to monitor yourselves and stay under the five minute limit. Uh, we ask everybody to refrain from any profane language, uh, and also not to make any personal attacks on anyone. Uh, and with that being said, <laughs> members of the public are welcome to use this time to make comments about city matters or items on the agenda that are not part of a public hearing, and there's no public hearing this evening. So please step to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and be heard. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is uh, Mike Jensen. And I own property at uh, 15665 Moonlight Road, uh, just a couple miles to the north of us. And uh, my purpose for wanting to, and, and thank you very much for the time tonight, I really appreciate it. Uh, my purpose for being here is I would like to make uh, my fellow citizens of uh, Gardner aware of a project that's going in on New Century. I feel like it's been done very quietly. Um, it is a project that's going to have what the CDC and the EPA and OSHA call a very hazardous material on it, and it's going to be a large qu quantity of very hazardous material. It's called anhydrous ammonia. Um, it's lethal. Um, it can be lethal. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, loss of life. We recently had a farmer that lost an eye just south of town. And uh, I don't feel like that we as a county government have done a good job of letting our citizens know what we're putting in their backyard. Uh, as you can see on the screen, um, the emergency response uh, requirements to treat uh, anhydrous ammonia spill or an or a unscheduled release or an accidental release is 1.5 miles. If you look at this Ames map that was prepared for us by the county, there's 2,000 or 1,845 homes within this 1.5 mile buffer around this project that our Board of County Commissioners has already voted to approve. Uh, they, voted, they voted seven to nothing to approve this. Uh, even though many of, of the landowners and the homeowners around had, had uh, uh, shared our concerns, not only about the anhydrous ammonia, but we shared our concerns about the fact that it's over height 
In fact, they broke about every PEC3 uh, zoning requirement that we're all required to follow. All of us on Moonlight Road purchased our homes and our property uh, relying on PEC3 zoning, which limits the height of a building to 45 foot. This building's gonna be 85 foot. They gave themselves uh, deviances for setbacks, parking, screening, uh, exterior material, you name it. There's more deviations than there are uh, conforming uh, to, the, to the codes. The most alarming thing is, uh, though, is the amount of thousands of gallons of extremely hazardous and hydrous ammonia that's going to be on site. The company's lineage logistics, I don't know much about them except what I can go on the internet on OSHA and EPA. I can see the company uh, and its affiliates have had several serious spills. One of them was in Mobile, Alabama by Millard Refrigeration. 150 people were sent to the local hospitals. Uh, another one was in McAllen, Texas just last year. They had a large spill of, of ammonia. They were fined $58,000 for nine very serious uh, violations. This substance is covered by the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. The problem with the Right to Know Act is we get the right to know after it's already sitting in our backyard. That's when we get to know that the anhydrous is there. It's after it's already been put there. So we have asked our county, our county commissioners to reverse themselves on this. They haven't done it. And we just want to make the citizens of Gardner, if you could scroll this down a little bit. And also, I want to point out that our adult retention center, our adult detention center and uh, the minimum security detention center are within uh, a thousand feet of this. Uh, my question is, we do have a, when we do have a serious spill, not if we don't, because these uh, type of, of, of uh, uh, operations where they're cooling to 22 below zero, they have problems. I worked in a plant with ammonia out of college. We had leaks all the time. Most of them didn't get reported unless somebody went to the hospital. I'm told the equipment's gotten better, but we're still humans and we operate it. And that's where most of the problem usually is. Ammonia is corrosive. It corrodes things, stuff breaks, and ammonia gets released to the atmosphere. And uh, I just don't feel like uh, this is something that anybody in Gardner wants in their backyard. There have been times where the evacuation area radius has been pushed out to five miles. If we push an evacuation out to five miles, that's all of Gardner and, and 30,000 people. This is not something we want in our backyard. And uh, I want the people of Gardner to know about this. We've, we're, we're, we're making people, especially in Copper Springs, aware. And I'm going to be integral. My time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Thanks, Mike. One thing that I want to add to uh, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, for anybody else that might be coming up that may not attend these meetings on a regular basis, uh, public comments are the public's time to address city council. Uh, it's not an interactive exchange between us where you come up and ask <laughs> questions and, and we answer them. Uh, we do speak at the end of the meeting during uh, council updates. Oftentimes we will mention uh, and make plans for what to do next based on things that we heard during public comments. So, podium's open. Anyone else that would like to speak, please step forward. State your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Randy Hutchins. I live at 16870 South Dilly Road. Um, I'm a local farmer here, and also with me is um, Mr. Brunker here. Um, Mr. Brunker's wife is actually the president of the, of the Johnson County Farm Bureau organization. I'm a board member of the Farm Bureau um, organization as well. And the reason I'm here tonight is um, recently, um, uh, myself and some other local farmers have been ticketed for running our farm um, trucks from the elevator to our farm fields. And, you know, with that being said, you know, we want to, you know, set the legal part of that aside for a moment. But um, just, you know, common sense perspective, we want to make sure that we have your support and simply traversing from the elevators to our fields in the most direct route possible 
both me and, and Charlie Brunker both have farms that are within the city limits, that border the city limits, and we just simply need your support in making sure that we can go from the straightest line possible from the elevator, our farms, to our fields, and then get our grain back to the elevators. So again, we're just looking for your support from that perspective. Um, I know and this has been brought up previously, and I believe the chief of police had mentioned that you know he had concerns about his officers being able to differentiate local farm trucks from over the road trucks. Um, I did share some pictures um, with the city council. I'm not sure if they're available, but um, at any rate, a farm truck actually has one of two things. It either has a tag that will actually have a sticker that says farm, um, as well as we, you know, from, from the Department of Transportation here in Kansas, uh, we're required to put our farm name, the city, the state, note that it is a farm vehicle and it's not for hire. So both with the license plate you can see there in the red it says farm, um, as well as on the side of our trucks, it says farm vehicle, not for hire. We think it'd be you know very fair for our officers in the town to, to verify that it is a farm vehicle versus an over the road vehicle. So again, looking for an exemption uh, for farm trucks and your no truck routes. Thank you, Reed. Thanks, Randy. My name is Heath Freeman at 602 North Walnut here in Gardner. Uh, I'd forgotten from this side, you, you still get really nervous on that side of the mic. It's, it's not so bad, but on this side, my, my man, still next to her. Um, before the science uh, talk started, I did have three things I wanted to ask of council. The number one, people are probably aware today is National Purple Heart Day, and I'd like to see the city start the process to be designated as a Purple Heart City. Um, I looked a little bit into it. I think it's really mostly a paperwork type situation, but um, as you drive along some of the state highways, you go into towns in and out, that will have that designation, and I just think it's a great way for us to honor our veterans and those heroes that have fought on our behalf. So I ask that council start that process or dictate staff to research that further so that we can look into those things. The other thing I wanted to ask is that council consider exploring home room or home rule opportunities in regards to elections and changing our primary elections to allow for six candidates in all of our uh, general council elections. I feel like what we learned this time is that uh, primary process gets abbreviated a little bit and some of the opportunities for either forums, get to knowing candidates, the choices get limited a little bit too quickly. So I think it wouldn't be any hindrance to allow six individuals at the time of the primary. You'd have to ask uh, Mr. Dink if that's a possibility under home rule if we could. I don't, I don't want to change what triggers the primary, only the number of candidates that advance to the general and allow for more opportunities for citizens to engage and get to know those people. Then the last thing I wanted to ask of council was that um, at some point they dictate staff to take no further action on the paper of record. Uh, and, and considering changes, we've seen, I, I uh, did a core request to see the emails that were shared with staff. I wanted to see that information as well. What we found out is in the three surveys, some on scientific, some done within the city, all three of those show that Gardner citizens preferred by over a two to one margin to get their news through the Gardner News, the local source for news. Um, the small town newspaper is the trusted resource for local news. That's where you turn when you want to find out what's going on within the city. That's what we do. And then the third thing we learned after it went through is this is a minuscule item with on a budget line item, not something that we're talking about very calculatable dollars at all. And I just think it's best to continue business with uh, a small town home newspaper. I think it's a lifeblood for these communities, whether we always agree with the editorials or not, even with news as it's being reported. That, that's where we turn for news is our, our small town newspaper. I, I'm thankful that we still have one. Um, not all cities in Kansas are able to say that, even though we're a big small town. Even the big small towns are losing the papers, and we aren't. So I think we need to take advantage of that and support them whenever we can. So I appreciate everyone's time. Those are the things I wanted to start before the sign kerfuffle. Thanks. Thank you, Heath. My name is Lori Reese. I live at 28605 West 159th Terrace here in Gardner, Kansas. Uh, last time I got up and spoke in front of a group of people was 25 years ago when I was still active duty and pretty upset about something, and I'm pretty upset about something now. Mike Jensen stopped by my house on Saturday and informed me about this cold storage that's going in less than a mile from my house. When I first bought this home, 
it was a big deal because I was 50 years old. I had raised three kids on my own. I finally decided to buy a house. I have commitment issues. I had young children, financial issues. Finally, I'm here. And I bought it with informed consent. I know the airport is nearby. And having lived on an air base, I understand the inherent hazard of that. The road at uh, Moonlight and the slight weird uh, visibility issues trying to get off the 159th Street. I understood that. But I had no idea that somebody would approve building a cold storage place with 65,000 pounds of ammonium near our, our place. Um, it is a hazard. It is alkaline. It leaks all the time. The industry does not police itself very well. I worked at a nuclear plant for seven years. And we were very angry about these companies that allow these kind of chemical leaks because if we allowed that at a nuclear plant, we'd be shut down because everybody's worried that it's a nuclear issue. But they can go along and leak it everywhere on multiple occasions. You've already had two in the state of Kansas this year alone, in Tyson at Hutchison, and again further west in, uh, at Tony's Pizza. It will happen here. It's not a matter of if, it's when, and it'll happen multiple times. And I'm very upset that it is going to happen within a mile of my house. Do I sell now? Do I leave the city of Gardner? How do I do it with a clear conscience, selling it to another family who's going to be living near this hazard? I just wanted to go on the record for how angry I am, how upset I am, and how disappointed I am that this has been approved and that nobody is doing anything to stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Good evening. I'm Amy Woodson. This is Chris Quarter. We are here on behalf of our sign, our royal sign that was put up uh, two over two years ago. Um, it all started in um, 2014. My father and I, um, you know, World Series is coming up, you know, the, the big games, you know, it's exciting. We decided to just one night get together. We're going to make this amazing sign. You know, the first one, not so great. The second one was even better because we that's the who we are. We're very crafty. We're very creative. So we got together. I hand drew it out. Um, he cut it out. I painted it. He cut out the holes for the lights. I mean, it was a definitely father-daughter bonding time where we really wanted to make something just because we're proud fans. Um, and obviously, you know, very artistic. <laughs> we can't go without that part. Um, so it was just something that we really wanted to do to show, you know, that we, we were big fans. Um, and of course, in that result, we had this posted in my father's front yard on big, beautiful, lit up poles just for people on a main street to drive by and give honks to, you know, yeah, we're in the World Series now, you know, that kind of thing. Um, as a result of that, it ended up on the Kansas City Star website. Um, all these major landmarks, you know, from the plaza to downtown, they showed all these pictures of everything lit up in blue. And then at the very end, number 34, my sign, which was shocking. <laughs> it's like, out of all the signs, why this little sign? But anyway, um, it was just something incredible for me to experience and my father. Um, most amazing feeling. Um, when I moved to Gardner here in 2015, I moved in with my boyfriend Chris Quarter, and we decided, you know, hey, let's let's put this on our back deck. You know, it needs to be somewhere other than just sitting in the yard. We thought maybe it would be a little bit better and look nicer instead of just on posts in the corner. <laughs> we thought maybe just to have it attached to, well, not attached, but hung up against the um, railings of our deck because it looked, I thought, a lot better. <laughs> So that's what we did, um, and we had the lights working for a while. They did not work, so you know, no big deal. People could still drive by. We had lots of great responses. You know, parents saying, "Oh my God, we love your sign." Kids saying, "Oh, we're home! Yay!" <laughs> How do we know? Because of this sign. Um, and that sign started many things with us, like creating new wooden projects. So it wasn't just, you know just some sign to us. It was kind of like our art piece, our artwork, part, part of us. Um, so, and the fact that it's been there for over two years and nothing was said until now, it's kind of heartbreaking knowing that if this sign comes down after all this time, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, like, what did I do wrong? You know, I guess I, you, nobody ever told me about the rules or regulations, things like that. So it was kind of a bummer to find this out after this long. Is that your five minutes? I don't know. There's a limit for people. It's okay. You can take over, sir. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to hear our defense. And then I'd like to apologize to the chief of police for all the negative comments. It was not the uh, intention of the post on the 
Gardner Facebook. So sorry for the negative that came out of it. I received the um, letter last Thursday um, that a lot from the CEO or the code enforcement officer that uh, someone had made a complaint about a large Rolls crown sign displayed on the back deck of the property for several, several years. My question to that is, it's been up there. Why now? Why is there a complaint now? It's considered a wall sign, which is a sign painted, printed, and attached to the exterior surface of a building. Okay, we're in the wrong on that because it's attached to our deck, okay? If we go down to where it says without a permit, you can have a temporary sign not exceeding four feet. What do you mean by four feet, okay? The width of our uh, sign is 47 inches, okay? That means the requirement of that part. It's about four feet tall, so it's four by four, 16 square feet. And it says you can attach that to the deck and put it in, or put it in your yard for 90 days out of the year. So go down to where it says temporary wall signs. Allowed at two signs per facade, not to exceed a total area of 5% of facade area, but no more than two, or no more than eight square feet per sign. Okay, so you're saying to put, we can put two signs up that are eight square feet, but we can't put one up that's 16 square feet. Okay. You see all kinds of signs around town. There's two different types of signs that I think there are. A positive sign and a negative sign. I think everyone knows what a negative sign would be. We've got nothing but positive responses. I mean, you can look, you can look on the Facebook page. You see all the responses. Great sign. I love seeing that after a hard day at work. Okay, that's worth it to me right there. Is there a right answer to the side ordinance? No, because we live in a uh, society now that everything and anything can offend anyone. Right now, I'm probably offending someone now on how I'm speaking, standing, or by the clothes I'm wearing. But you know what? It's my right to wear the clothes, talk the way I'm talking, the way I'm standing. So, is there a logical answer? I think there is, just by the positive feedback. Do I have the answer? No. But I can't just come up here and complain about it. I gotta provide some suggestions. Are they the right suggestions? I don't know. No one knows. My first one would be, since we submit to the HOA what color we can paint our house, what uh, shed we can put it, where we can put it, why can't we pr present to them what sign we want to put up, and then they make the approval. Second, if it's not an HOA community, then they would have to submit a request to the city and they say yes or no, this is appropriate, this isn't appropriate. Or just make it straight across the board. Your request goes to the city, you pay a fee to have it up, they say yes or no, and you renew that fee every year. Just a couple suggestions. Just to cover the First Amendment, um, when this came up, the case of Reed versus Town of Gilbert, Arizona came up. First Amendment is an amendment to the United States Constitution guaranteeing the rights of free expression and action that are fundamental in democratic government. These rights include freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and freedom of speech. So by having this sign on my deck is expressing me being a fan of the Royals and supporting them. Is it not? And finally, I want to apologize to the single person that offended our ice. Let me start. Again. I want to apologize to the single person that our sign offended. Whether you're in this room or not, the sign is on my property that I pay for each month. I pay the taxes on it. I'm sorry if it was, wasn't the right color or that you just not a Royals fan. And I do also have my rights to freedom of speech and protect what's on my property. And that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Amy. Hi, Daniel Benson. 3-1 through 3-1, Barbara Court. Uh, I'm actually the president of the Double Gate Homes Association in which Chris lives. Uh, so I need to put a disclaimer out there because this is just me here as a private citizen. So the views and opinions I'm about to express are mine only and do not necessarily reflect any official policy or position of the Double Gates Homes Association. Any policy suggestions made from this point forward 
are for, only for consideration of the City Council and have no bearing on any current or proposed rule changes within the Dubgate's Home Association. So, <laughs> who wouldn't let me do it unless? <laughs> <coughs> so, Mayor, uh, esteemed council members, thank you for allowing me time to speak on some current issues. I am the president of the Double Gate Homes Association, and this is the subdivision in which Mr. Corbett and his family reside. I'm speaking now as a sole property owner within the subdivision and feel that his family has received overwhelming support from the neighborhood. It is my personal opinion that this is more in line with a logo <laughs> and or yard decor and not a sign. Using the basic definitions, I'd like to draw a distinction between a sign and a logo. Is that a sign is a visible indication. For example, stop sign. Mm -hmm. Well, logo is a symbol or an emblem that acts as a trademark or means of identification of an institution or an entity. And the Royals are an institution. The intent of the statute, in part, verbatim, is to protect property value by minimizing adverse effects of signs on adjacent property, which can occur from conditions such as light, trespass, obstructing the views and access, or visual blight. So where does that fall under? There's clearly no obstruction at play here, and can say that this is the first instance where anyone has complained about it. That has not come to our board or anything like that before. Moreover, to ensure that the constitutionally guaranteed right of free speech is protected while allowing signs as a mean of public communication. I would say that this logo is more in line with personal expression than anything else. The intent isn't to advertise, but to express their celebration of a once in a blue moon event. While there are some things that are out of control of the council, I would hope that you consider at least a variance for Mr. Corder and his family. On another note, I would like to speak about some chronic city code violations within our subdivision that are not being addressed, either through our board or through the city. <clears throat> and I think that mainly is just a matter of manpower, because it's just one, right? So my concern is with public safety, and we have several instances where mail routes are blocked, sidewalks are blocked, we have parking on both sides of the street, obstructing traffic. Our mobility corridors are limited, and the root of the problem is that people just simply aren't managing their space efficiently, and it's bleeding out into the street, the sidewalk, etc. We know it's a violation of city code to park in such a way as it obstructs the sidewalk. There are some people that are just oblivious. They don't know about it until you point it out. To assess how bad the parking situation and our subdivision really was, I requested earlier this year for the fire chief to take a drive in the neighborhood and advise how much of a challenge it would be to get their emergency vehicles through to respond to a crisis. The letter, if anybody wants to see it. I think you can give it to the city clerk after you're done. Yep. Okay. So this, so this letter please see for your review, explains that to set up their aerial trucks require 18 feet of hard surface. We measured the main mobility corridors and most are only 24 feet from one side to the other. According to the OEM Ford 2017 F-150 with tractor tow mirrors is just over eight feet, so mirror to mirror. There are many vehicles of this size in our subdivision, so I hope this illustrates the problem. With a population of nearly 22,000, Gardner needs more than just one code enforcement officer to, keep, to really keep pace with the demand. What I will ask of the council is in the future to allocate more funds for human resources to the code enforcement department and take a more proactive rather than reactive approach to complaints. So, thank you. Thank you Thanks. very much, Dave. Thank you. My name is Vince Workowich. I live at 15445 South Moonlight Road. I'm about a half mile north of the building that Mr. Jensen talked about. Uh, I am retired from the Sheriff's Office. 
put 32 years in there. I was in charge of the operations building right across the street from where this proposed building is going to go. And I did manage to jail five weeks out of the year when that particular major was on vacation. What concerns me is that the county planning commission and the commissioners never made any attempt, obviously, to contact any of you folks. They made no attempt to contact the fire department because I've heard a rumor that there's inadequate water pressure at this time to fight a fire in a building that's 85 foot tall. And they've certainly not discussed the uh, dangerous ammonia potential at that site. I can tell you that the jail across the street has one positive atmosphere unit in it. That's the medical unit. And not even that entire medical unit is positive atmosphere. So if there is a leak and it occurs in the fall or winter when the wind's out of the north, there is going to be significant issues in the jail. They can't evacuate it. It's not designed to be evacuated. There's not enough duct tape to seal up the cracks. Um, and I can tell you there's probably no more than 12 SCBAs in the building, self-contained breathing apparatuses in the building. So you're going to end up with significant issues concerning the, uh, the employees and the inmate population. And I will tell you that the inmates, most of them are pre-incarceration inmates. They just are there because they can't make bond. So these are your neighbors, your children that are in jail that just couldn't make bond, and they deserve the same rights that any of us have. And they're treated accordingly by the sheriff's office. But obviously the county commissioners don't think that their safety is important enough to keep this time bomb from being built right across from the jail. Uh, I can't speak for the sheriff. <coughs> Uh, I haven't talk, talked to him about this because I've only become aware of the ammonia issue just in the last few days, uh, but it's something that I will reach out to him and talk about. Uh, and I really urge you guys to, at the very least, talk to your fire department here in the city and ask them what kind of dangers this presents and talk to your chief of police about uh, evacuation issues trying to get not only the people out of this mile and a half area, but their pets, everything else that's important to them. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Vince. Thanks, Vince. Good evening. My name's Al Sanchez. I live at 31150 West 170th Terrace. I'd like to make just a couple of quick comments about the golf course that we talked about earlier. Um, I have to disagree with the eloquent speaker that was here earlier. I'm assuming he was paid to put together the information, though if he was, he, uh, he spoke very eloquent and at the very end he told you you shouldn't do it. I'd like to say that I'd like for once to ask you as a city council to try not to spend our tax dollars and do it and let a private industry or someone else do that. Um, that would be the first thing I'd like to ask. <clears throat> the second thing is um, I look at the sign because I live right down the street and I look at this royal sign and I'm a pretty grouchy old guy so every time I come down that street it, I perk up and I say well, there is some sanity in the world, and, and everything's beautiful and everything's right. Okay, even though I am a kind of grouchy old guy. So, for every rule, there is, I think, a solution or a revision or maybe a little sanity in saying this is a good thing for our city. So, I'd like to ask that you do give the variation or you do consider a change because I wasn't the grouchy old guy that said I didn't like it. So I wasn't that, that person that complained. I understand you have your rules. I, I get that, but I think this is a positive thing and I agree. And I've looked at it for the last two years and every time I turn the corner, it makes my wife mad that I smile, but I, I, I like it. So, and I think a lot of people do. 
So if you look right across the street at the there's a big sign that looks like it's about to fall down. It's called the Bristol Group. It's the perpetual empty spot that we have in Gardner of what are they ever going to do with it. It's faded. It looks like crud and it looks like it's going to fall down. So I'm not sure where, I don't know which one you did this, but come to see about signs, we ought to maybe look into that sign because I think it's a hazard. I think that there's six foot or taller weeds growing in the middle of that lot. We hope that someday, because there's a lot of kids that drive through there, that's a very busy intersection when they're heading to school, that they would pay attention to this lot and so that we could be proud of that area. We've got spent millions of dollars on that high school. So I'd just like to ask those those things that you look at, things that make sense. And, and please don't spend my, uh, our tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Anyone else? With no one else coming forward, we're going to move on. <laughs> To the consent agenda, is there a council member that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? I'd like to remove item four from the consent agenda, please. Okay. Would you approve items one through three? Second. Motion of winners. winners. Second, Harrison, <laughs> that we approve consent agenda items number three. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstention? Consent agenda items number one through three pass. Consent agenda item number four. Consider authorizing the city administrator to execute contract change order with or Wyatt Streetscape for additional subgrade work and con concrete surfacing on the 2017 Parks and Recreation Pedestrian Trail Replacement Project. Steve, you've got questions. I've got a I've got a few of them. Well, first of all, first of all, I, I I know that there's been some frustration. One of the reasons why I wanted to pull this out is because we've all gotten some some feedback uh, from many members of the community about the the uh, delays on the uh, Madison Street uh, trail and uh, I know that uh, we had had some previous discussion in previous meetings about why that was happening um, but I don't know if that ever got to the general community so I wanted to, to go through that exercise and let people know uh, why this change order is, is being put through and secondly I know Tim, you're you're here this week uh, for uh, for Michael. I don't know if you could uh, speak on some of the issues that might come up in addition you know, for any additional change orders that might be above and beyond what works what we're seeing here. Because I know we're looking at a hundred and hundred twenty thousand dollars in change orders in this particular um, item. But are there any other chances that we might have additional overruns over what we have right here, given what's happening with subsidence of the soil? Well, of course, I can't say with absolute certainty, but really, I think this change order pretty much just finishes up the project. Okay. Um, again, we, you know, anytime there's unforeseen conditions, that, that can change. But again, I think that's they're pretty well addressed with all this. And, and once this change order is completed, that that should uh, end the project. Okay. And the other question is, uh, there was a question about what would be happen. What what were the contingency plans for? Uh, students who are trying to walk to the high school or walk to Sunflower Elementary uh, down Madison, utilize the trail, what what kind of mitigation procedures are we going to have in terms of, uh, of, of traffic in those times when there's, we're not going to get this done by the, t by the start of school, obviously. So what what's the uh, contingency plans in place? Do we have any kind of uh, uh, plans between yourself and maybe the police department on how to manage that? Yes, uh, we've been working with the school district on a plan for that, and uh, starting tomorrow we'll be putting up a uh, snow fence on the north side of Madison, uh, the idea being to direct all the students to the north side. Uh, coming from the west, they will uh, travel east to Buckeye, um, and then cross to the south where there will be a crossing guard at that location. And then uh, my understanding is the school will put up uh, through a through the grassy area on the south side outside the construction area they'll be putting up a fence to um, to guide the students towards the school at that point 
Okay. And then when do we expect this? If we, if we approve the change order this evening, which I fully expect we will, when, when are we looking at for an ETA for completion of this? If we, if weather cooperates, and of course we can't control the weather, but. Uh, the change order has been written for the work to be done by September 13th or substantially complete, meaning uh, that it's basically it's usable. Um, I, I have no reason to think it will be, I mean, it could be sooner than that, but I, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't count on that. So we're talking five weeks. Is there any, is there, is there any possible, uh, the reason why is because there is a safety issue here, and so that's my, big, my biggest concern. Is there anything? I mean, is this is this a is this a rush type of uh, change order, or is this something that I mean, uh, can they can we make it happen a little faster than five weeks, or is that just the limitation technically? Well, um, I I can't speak to to where that number actually came from. Um, I know that uh, that Michael was negotiating with the contractor, and that was part besides the cost. The time was part of it, and I know. Um, um, there, there may have been issues with other work the contractor's doing, and you know what does he have now that he's actually you know, working beyond uh, the time frame the, the, the project had originally been scheduled to complete. So, uh, so I can't speak to those details. I mean, I can certainly uh, look more into that and find out. Uh, you know, typically once you you do try to speed the project up, it drives the cost up. I understand that. I understand that. I, I did have a question or more of a statement I wanted to um, bring this up. I noticed on the um, change order that a lot of this information was presented uh, on the 17th, so we can right after our last email. We, I, I think in the future it would be beneficial for staff if, if something like this comes up and we know that there's a school involved and everything else, and I wouldn't be opposed to having a special meeting to get something like this knocked out. Uh, to make sure, because if we're talking five weeks, next week would have been done if we'd have done this right away. So I think from a future standpoint, that would be good. I don't think any governing body is going to have a problem with that, calling a special meeting for I don't, I don't expediting know. this. It would have still been held up a little bit by the weather, but it, at least it would have been done in a timely fashion. So just for the future, I think that's a good thing to do. I agree. I agree. I agree. Questions, comments? I, I just have one question. So, so Tim, I know um, you know during construction there are things that come up that that will require a change request. But for this particular item, is there anything internally that we're going to do differently to make sure that we minimize these types of change requests in the future? So, how are we identifying the issues with the sub grading and so forth in the future, so that those can be included and covered in future bids? Sure. Uh, you know, one of the problems we always deal with with construction is unforeseen conditions, and, and that often happens in subsurface. One thing we, we certainly can do and I think should do in the future is uh, get out early and, and take some samples, do some borings, and get some information uh, before the design is even complete. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Not I'd entertain a motion on consent agenda item number four. So moved. Second. Motion shoot second Harrison. That we approve consent agenda item number four. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Consent agenda item number four passes. New business item number one. Consider appointing Amy Waller as Gardner City Clerk and administer the oath of office. Uh, before we just move to that, anybody want to hear from uh, Cheryl Harrison Lee or Amy about uh, how she came to be here? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. You know there'd be a test. Didn't you? Okay. She's she's she, she's new. Put you put you on the spot. I promise I won't do that next time. Yes. Uh, Yes, we have um, Alan Abramovitz here who can give a brief overview of uh, Amy's background and experience. <laughs> I like that look, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Passing that right off, man. That's pretty good. Thank you. Um, and Amy, if I say anything wrong, please correct me. <laughs> so, uh, from uh, 
February of 2007 to May of 2011, uh, she was city clerk of Eolia, Missouri. Uh, and can you tell us where that is? It's just north of St. Louis, about an hour. Okay. And then uh, she was a, after that, uh, for uh, about six months, she was a facilitator assistant uh, for the Walt Disney Company in Celebration, Florida. And then she became the guest experience manager uh, for the Walt Disney Company uh, at Port Orleans Resort. And then most recently, she was the grounds manager uh, or a grounds manager for the Kansas City Zoo. And she's been in that job for approximately a year. Uh, as far as her education, <laughs> She has a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. She graduated summa cum laude with a GPA of 3.95. And then she also has a Master of Arts from North Central University in Prescott, Arizona, where she had a GPA of 3.86. Okay, any questions? Okay. Well, I'd ask her to step forward along with Tim, Tim to administer the oath. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And the Constitution of the State of Kansas. In the Constitution of the State of Kansas. And faithfully discharge the duties as the city clerk as the as the city clerk for the city of Gardner. Sorry. And faithfully discharge the duties of the city clerk of the city of Gardner. So help me God. So help me God. Mr. Mayor, I think there is supposed to be formal action. You made the appointment, but it's oh, supposed yep. to be with consent of, of the governor. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to appoint Amy Waller. <laughs> second. Uh, motion Harrison, second more that we appoint Amy Waller, effective August 7, 2017, as Gardner City Clerk. And uh, we directed Kim to administer the oath. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Welcome. Next item on the agenda, uh, new business item number two. Consider adopting a resolution declaring the intent of the city of Gardner uh, to issue general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed uh, $13,725,000 for the purpose of financing the costs of certain public improvements within the city. Laura. Good evening. Good evening. So this is a follow-up to the Justice Center vote, and for the benefit of the audience, I'll go through it really quickly. At the May 1st meeting, the governing body authorized the calling of a bond election in an amount not to exceed $13.725 million in general obligation bonds to, just, to construct and equip a facility to be used as a police department headquarters, municipal court, and other <laughs> community purposes. And on August 1st, voters approved, and because I'm a finance person I round up. The election results were 71% yes and 29% no. As stated in the resolution that you're considering, the bonds will be issued in late 2017 or early 2018. And regardless of when we issue the bonds, the first debt payment is going to be due on October 1st, 2018. The resolution also notes that the Kansas statutes require that the amount of property tax to be levied or the budget has to be certified by August 25th of this year, which is going to be before when we issue the bonds. Because of the new tax lid, in order to keep the money for the debt service payment, you ha that's also in the resolution because we're only allowed to keep anything, anything about the consumer price index, you had to have a vote. Well, you did have a vote. So 
um, passage of the resolution is nece is necessary for the creation of the bond and interest payment sufficient to allow the city to keep the property valuation increase above the CPI for the 2018 budget. So um, the resolution itself states that it's your intent to issue the bonds, include the first debt service payment and for the bonds in the fiscal year 2018, and cost certification of the property taxes to be made to the county clerk of Johnson County, Kansas in the amount that includes the debt service for the bonds, as I said, in 2018. That payment will be what we said it will be. I want to make sure maybe, maybe this helps. Um, we discussed that the mill rate would stay the same. And at your direction, all the growth in the valuation was directed to the debt service fund. <coughs> So that's exactly what happened. The general fund, I already cocked this out, and Nancy's waiting in the back to give the thumbs up to send it to the paper by 8.30 in the morning. That's section your maximums in your public hearing. Your general fund mill levy will go down 1.525, and the bond and, interest le bond and interest levy goes up 1.525. The mill levy stays exactly the same. It is the property valuation that we're capturing for the debt service payment. Now, in the future, there's many things that impacts the levy. Another component of this is the courthouse sales tax that you directed to be used for these payments as well. So this 2018 levy, it's we're good to go. We know how much it's going to be because we're going to make that first debt service payment what we say it's going to be. After we sell the debt, the remaining 19 years can be restructured to do whatever we wanted to do. And every year's levy from after this one will be a combination of things. It'll be impacted by the valuation growth because you get to keep CPI and new improvements. So any new development will be beneficial. The performance of the county sales tax will impact it. If it's not enough, we may have to do something else with the mill levy. If it's gangbusters, that'll be a beneficial impact. Um, and also any increases and decreases in debt service or other projects that you're going to do over the next 19 years. So um, the levy is the gap, the gap between the revenue streams and the debt service. So we got 2018 all handled. 2019 from then on will just be year by year like we always do. But uh, a little good news for you is sausage is ground and the estimate in the notice of publication of nine point, what did I say it was? I think I said it was going to be 9.7, hold on, I have it, 9.74. Anyway, you already saved a mill just because of the when we ground the sausage, the CPI, Consumer Price Index, and the new improvements, and some other fluctuations and things within the budget and some fund balance, you're already a mill to the good. So with that, if you have anything else to say, my Council Ellsworth is here, as well as City Attorney Dink. Well, we'll open it up for public comments. It's a pretty dense subject, but anybody that wants to come up and talk about it, you're certainly welcome. With no one coming forward, questions for Laura, Bond Council Ellsworth, or City Attorney Dank. I have one question. The language of the resolution states an amount not to exceed 13725 mm -hmm. If we get to 2018 and we're issuing debt and we get into you know, an RFP, we decide that um, we don't need to issue $13.725 million bonds. Do we have to? It says not to exceed. It does not say there's no minimum. There's only a maximum. Okay, I'm going to take one piece of that out, and then I'm okay. going to call Bond Council Ellsworth for okay. that one, because that's, that's probably above me. What I do want to make sure everybody in this room understands is whatever happens with that number, the debt service payment is what it is because financial advisor Kimmel can force that number to be, that's it, so we levy correctly. Sure. And then we'll 
adjust the other 19 years. So with that being said, Don Pounds Ellsworth, would you please come answer the question? I have no clue. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, to answer the question, you are not obligated as council to issue $13.725 million in debt late this year or early next year. Um, but what you are obligated to do is issue debt and construct a project that comports to the will of the voters that was expressed last week. So I would counsel you not to peel off portions of that project or reduce the scope of it. If there are construction savings, for example, that you can realize uh, based on the bids that you receive or something like that, that may decrease that cost estimate, um, that's certainly not something that I'm uncomfortable with. Um, but I would, I would advise you not to reduce the scope of the project, basically. So if you can realize savings and bring that number down, that's fine. As you mentioned, there's not a minimum. But there is some sense of the project that was presented to the voters uh, yes. prior to last Tuesday, and that's what needs to be constructed. And all of them, and I, I was about to get there because the ballot language very clearly states it's going to be for a police station, municipal court, and other community purposes. Correct. So we have to have that scope of the project because that is what the ballot initiative says. Correct. But within that scope, there is variance, and I think that we need to, as a, as a body, uh, look at options that will, you know, try to minimize that cost of the taxpayer as much as possible. Uh, can, can I say one, yeah. one other thing? And you correct me if I'm wrong. I, the, because we were so careful to craft that ballot language, one other thing that it specifically says is this is all, we're not phasing this and we're not That's issuing right. the debt in phases either. Right. So. With, right. with the scope of the project yep. and not being phased and not peeling pieces off, I think Correct. you're good. Correct. It's a design build, but we do have some flexibility from the standpoint of, of materials and those kind of things. So that's what I'm trying to mention. Sure, sure. To the extent that that wasn't presented to the voters as this is what the project is going to be, yep. you absolutely have to have flexibility. Okay. And we're not going to be issuing debt until 2018. Correct. This. this is not issuing the debt. It's not selling the debt. There's none of that. First, as you mentioned, you have to complete the design of the project, and then Correct. you have to look at bids and what it's going to cost. So we're not there yet. But as Laura pointed out, you have to set your budget and certify the budget and the property tax levy prior to the issuance of the bonds. Okay. And one other thing. You may recall every time we issue debt or start a debt project, we do a resolution of intent yep. so that we can reimburse ourselves from the bond proceeds for all the costs of the project. So this actually starts the clock. Correct. So that's what this does as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Yep. Entertain a motion on resolution number 1972. So moved. Second. second. Motion shoot second, Melton. Let me adopt resolution number 1972. Authorizing the city of Gardner, Kansas, to issue general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed thirteen million seven hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, for the purpose of financing the costs of certain public improvements within the city. Uh, city clerk, can you call roll, please? Council Member Rogers. Yes. Council Member Melton. Yes. Council Member Shute. Yes. Council Member Harrison. Yes. Council Member Moore. Yes. Resolution number 1972 passes uh, municipal court and our men and women in law, law enforcement are going to have themselves a shiny new law enforcement center, uh, justice center, one of these guys. Looking forward to it, Chief. So. Thank you, Mr. That will do it for regular session. Up next. Uh, we're going to move on to council updates. Uh, we will start with staff, uh, and I'm actually I'm going to go first to Larry Powell. I know uh, a lot of everybody should have had to receive the memorandum uh, that uh, Larry sent out. I sent him an email this morning after hearing from a constituent asking a particular question and the information that he provided back was informative and uh, Larry uh, considering we were talking about the signs I'm going to start with you and then I'm going to move over to the chief and then we'll, we'll work the usual magic around the uh, 
pass. So. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, first of all, the question that was asked for, so that the public will understand what we're talking about, was uh, whether or not the uh, Royals uh, sign that we've talked about earlier this evening would have been a violation under the old code, because we've been under this new code since, uh, since August, uh, roughly, of last year. And the question, the answer to that is yes. It, as a matter of fact, the old code didn't allow any type of signage in residential neighborhoods at all. So there would not have been uh, a permit even available to them to take for, on a temporary basis for the uh, old code. So the new sign code actually allows you to have a temporary sign up to 90 days. Uh, the size of that sign, of course, is, it varies with what you're trying to make, but they don't even need a permit for a small sign, a two by two, which is four square feet. They can have a four square foot sign, two by two or four by one, whichever size you want to make it to get there. Uh, and they can put that uh, basically on their on their property, and, and it's perfectly allowed. Uh, question also was brought on the sidelines: What about flags? Because we uh, wanted to know whether or not uh, flags were regulated, and we do not regulate uh, flags of any type. So if you wish to put a flagpole up and run a Royals flag or a Pirates flag or a Chiefs flag or a city flag, whatever you need, uh, maybe you're from France and you want to put France flag up there, you can do that. Uh, we don't regulate those. We do regulate height limitations for those, but uh, and there are some limitations, structural limitations to making sure the pole is safe, but other than that, there's no regulation involved with that. Uh, are there any other questions about that particular aspect? Uh, just real quick, I'd like to give you a quick couple quick updates. I'm sure you've been watching the Dairy Queen rise up from the uh, from the ground over there. They're coming along very quickly uh, with that, and we do have about uh, two thirds of the underground piping in place. We'll be getting the rest of that. Uh, we hope soon, uh, and then that, of course, once the piping's in place, then they'll do the connections on the ends, and then they can start with the rest of the uh, infrastructure work on the on the grounds and the concrete and so forth. So that, that project's moving forward very quickly now. Uh, we uh, saw in the paper that we had the O'Reilly's project just started, which is a small uh, improvement. They're adding 2,400 square feet to the back of that facility. We're happy to see that. Uh, the Hampton project's moving along. The public infrastructure, we're still waiting for some uh, work to get to, to get to us on the sewers. We have started the electrical, uh, uh, we've had the I should say the line paperwork's been given to us where the our power line has to be moved to. We won't construct that though until the storm water and everything else is in place so that we don't have to move that line one time. Uh, and we'll hopefully do that uh, in the coming months. Uh, that project is moving forward and you will be getting uh, additional updates on the Hampton Inn project and the conference center as we go through that. Uh, Dave Parma sends his uh, regards and, and asked me to thank you again on his behalf for working with him on that project. We also have, of course, the CVS project ongoing, and as you can see, Center Street is open. Uh, we're very thankful for that. However, there are uh, a lot of paving projects going on, which Tim will talk to you about uh, in regards to that area. And the paving that we did on Center Street is temporary. There's additional street improvements that will be made on the north side of Center, <laughs> north of, of Main Street. Uh, as we set the curb back all the way to Shawnee Street, though, so there's additional curb improvements in that area that would be made at a later date. We have to get some other sewer work and stuff out of the way first. And, and uh, Gons will have some, maybe have some comments on the electric work that's being done and the sewer work, etc. I think those are all the commercial projects that we have for you at this time. Okay. That's it. Larry, thanks. Chief? Yeah, I wanted to start by thanking the council for putting the Justice Center vote to the the public, and we wanted to thank the public for supporting the Justice Center. We're really excited about the opportunity and ready to get started. I wanted to clarify a couple things with codes enforcement that were brought up earlier. Um, even though we are complaint driven with our codes enforcement, um, that doesn't mean Carrie is sitting around waiting for a complaint to come in. Um, the complaint driven aspect of it I mean she's very busy throughout the day and on this particular complaint even if she would have gone out to look at the sign based on the complaint if she would have seen other signs in the area she would have addressed that 
So it's not just that specific place where the complaint is made. If there's other things that are visible in the area, she addresses those as well. So I wanted to make sure people were aware of that, that one, yes, we are complaint driven, but that does keep her very busy. And two, if there's any other residual things that she sees, she does address those. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, one of the gentlemen identified some, uh, uh, maybe some uh, violations out in Double Gate. Did you jot those down? Can you get carry after that? Yes, I did. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, we'll work our way around the bend here, uh, unless anybody's got questions for the well, chief. Yeah, I was going to mention, Go I was going to mention really quickly the whole thing about the, the, the Daniel spoke of from Double Gate, the, the, the president. I will tell you this, the biggest source of violations right now that I see in this community is exactly what he mentioned there, which is a which is blocking and obstruction of streets and sidewalks, particularly sidewalks. I think I could go into my neighborhood and every third house there is a car obstructing the sidewalk. In fact, there are situations where there is plenty of space in front of the car and they just happen to they, they park it right on the sidewalk. And, and I, I don't know what we can do about that. Um, it is clear from the standpoint of both passenger vehicles and RVs that that is not allowed. It's a public safety hazard. It is also a mobility hazard for people who can't get around other than through the sidewalks. So is there any way that we can be more proactive with enforcement of least that? There is, and, and I'll put something out on the, the department's Facebook and something through the city website. Um, because if you think codes enforcement makes people angry, Parking tickets is right up there. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> if we go out in the neighborhoods and start ticketing cars, then but we'll put something out and we'll start addressing that and and give people as much time and warning as possible. And I totally agree with that. But that is that has been in our codes forever, and it, it is a it is a real problem, especially for people, walkers, joggers, people who use wheelchairs. They can't use those sidewalks, and it's a real problem. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, gonna, oh, one other thing, Chief. The uh, uh, Mr. Hutchins and Mr. Brunker yes. were here about the farm trucks. And uh, does do you have the information that you need there? To yeah, I'll, I'll look into it. I'll get back with you. Oh, okay. fantastic. Thanks, Chief. All right. Um, guns. Uh, but before you get started, I noticed that KCPNL and Westar had about 180,000 households, uh, customers that weren't being served because of some electrical outages recently. How did we do? During the uh, recent storm, we didn't have any single outages. There was no damage to any of the uh, utility infrastructures. I would agree. So we were very fortunate. Thank you. Do you have anything else for us, Scott? Uh, no, sir. <laughs> Scott. Yeah, I have a few things. I just wanted to give you some updates on uh, a couple items. Uh, uh, give you a, uh, updates on a few events that we have. We have Gardner Grind coming up this weekend. Um, last year we had 267 registrants, and then uh, this year we have 402 so far. So uh, a bunch of people are going to come out and get muddy, and uh, that'll be um, that'll be fun. Um, the smoke on the trails and the Grand Slam uh, craft beer and wine. Uh, with the smoke on the trails, we currently have uh, 45 teams registered, and we can only take six more teams. And uh, my understanding is that, that having this many teams this far in the process is, um, I guess, significant. Um, the uh, so that should be rolling pretty well. Grand Slam, we've sold uh, 222 tickets so far, and. Uh, Got that going. Um, in regards to the pool, uh, you know that the uh, the rains had its fun times with us and whatnot. But despite all of that, um, we're up thirteen thousand dollars in revenue over this time last year. Um, we're up one hundred eighty three in memberships and uh, swim team. We're up sixty or not swim team. I'm sorry. Uh, 
uh, swim lessons, um, we have uh, 63 more participants than last year, and that revenue is up um, about $7,000. So we have that going. Um, also along, uh, we have the uh, Tri-County um, uh, Volleyball League that we have going, so we're doing that league. You all might have already seen that. Uh, working our league in conjunction with uh, a few other cities. Um, we're using um, uh, New Century Fieldhouse, and uh, actually a, a benefit of doing that uh, actually has turned out that um, we've pretty much eliminated a significant portion of our site supervisor costs since we don't have to provide those at uh, New Century. Um, we have, uh, looks like, A little over half than what we had registered last year at this point in time, but the deadline's what for another week, and um, and so you know with the uh, projections and having the same registrants last year, it will actually uh, improve our bottom line if uh, if we end up with the same registrants as last year. Um, so that's a big plus as well. Um, uh, in regards to uh, the golf course. Um, and some things in that regard, um, but I, we thought it was very important that one had all the information in order, you know, to be able to make any type of informed decision. Um, at the same time, one thing I will say is, is if it's anything other than a golf course, <laughs> there will still be a cost associated with that piece of property. So, um, you know, there is potential to work on a private, you know, public type of partnership. There is an interested party, um, but if we do let the course continue to, you know, degrade over time, it will actually add costs to whatever third party may be interested. So, um, you know, we have to consider those um, those aspects as well. Um, also, along those lines, as uh, Jim pointed out, you know, he showed the bridge and you know, talking about liability and some issues out there as well. Um, some. Again, some things we have to consider is that we're the landlord, the landowner, and um, and so we have a lot of you know issues that are jumbled up with that, and um, so these are some things that we'll have to seriously consider. Um, if we close down their maintenance shed, we potentially would then have an issue that Ryan and I have talked about before. Like if we end up if somebody ends up in default, then it could potentially confident that it would go to litigation, something to that effect. So. We're going to have to consider how far we want to take that. Um, and uh, I think the last thing I wanted to address was um, Councilwoman Harrison actually asked through Cheryl to provide some information regarding Gardner Gold Program. And so I actually have asked Adrian to come in and, and actually give us an update on that, if, if you don't mind her coming up and discussing oh, that great. a little bit. Thank you. Did you have anything specific? Yeah, if you could just kind of give an overview of the different events that we support. Is there a cost to the program? And is there any negative impact with the recent agreements with the school district to that program? Okay. Um, we currently are enrolling for our bocce and soccer um, in our Garter Gold program. And then we have a unified sports program at the high school, which is um, associated with Special Olympics, but it also incorporates the peers. Um, the team is made up of half kids with special needs and then their peers. So um, two different programs here, but it's all encompassing of our Special Olympics program. Um, that unified sports program is, um, we're currently offering basketball right now. So um, all, all the programs associated with the Garner Gold are completely free to our athletes. Um, we are just, we use our donations, we have a fundraiser every year to um, help offset any costs to the family, so it is all completely free. Um, and as far as the impact on the schools, right now our bocce and soccer are outdoors, so we use our own parks for those. Um, basketball at the, the high school, since it is a high school under, you know, it's all high school kids, we do ask for a gym at the high school. Last year they give us the MAC, um, a gym in the MAC, but I don't know. This year I've, I've requested, I haven't heard back, so, and that's not uncommon really. I should be hearing back anytime. I've followed up on my request and they, ju they just said they haven't had a chance to 
make a decision yet. But um, I guess that would be an impact if we aren't able to use the gym there. But other than that, um, we also then, so then this winter we'll do basketball and cheerleading, and those will also require a gym space at one of the schools. Um, the rest of our programs are we do bowling and um, swimming and track and field. So the rest is outdoor or, or off, you know, not not any use with the school. So okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Scott, anything else? No, I don't have anything else. Okay, uh, Tim, anything else from Public Works? Um, sure, just a couple of project updates. Uh, we've completed the uh, bridge construction uh, on Gardner Greenway. So the, the two bridges are up and they were not washed away in the last two storms. So we're <laughs> excited about that. Uh, a couple of projects coming up. We have some improvements at the Center Madison intersection. Um, that'll be starting in the next couple of weeks. We'll be adding uh, some protected left turn lanes and uh, new radar equipment for detection of vehicles there. And the, uh, the Center Street project, uh, the notice to proceed on that project was today. Uh, I don't have a firm start date, but the contractor will be mobilizing quickly to get started on that project. And that's starting at the uh, south end of the bridge out to the interstate, correct? Right. So from the bridge to uh, Grain Street, we'll be uh, removing and replacing curb and gutter <coughs> and then a mill and overlay. And from the south will be a simply be a mill and overlay. Okay. Fantastic. And uh, lastly, we, uh, we've gone through the selection process, hired a consultant to, or we haven't hired yet, we're negotiating with a consultant to do the, uh, perform the design of uh, Santa Fe between uh, Waverly and Poplar. So we'll be designing that this winter. That'll be a uh, 2018 construction project. Great. Well, the, the 2018 cars project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, city clerks. You guys have anything for us? Uh, Kim, how much longer are you going to be around? My last day is the 31st of this month. Okay. Are we going to see you at the next council meeting? <laughs> <laughs> if you so request. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to say thank you for all your months of faithful service. Yes. And uh, uh, I'm sure you're going to do an appropriate handover for Amy. Uh, but we appreciate you stepping in in a tough spot and, and serving probably longer than you anticipated. Uh, you, did a, you did a fine job. You were a pleasure to be around. Good luck in Arizona. I don't know why you would want to move there. Because there's no snow. <laughs> well, there's no snow here either, so. Uh, finance, anything for us? There we go. Okay, so when you approved the resolution of intent, Wednesday's paper is your notice of public hearing, which is next meeting before you must approve. And I sent you a Friday minute memo saying, because of the Justice Center vote this year, we don't get to separate those, so they'll be back to back. Yes. Okay. Okay, one more thing. There are no surprises. You, you've already made all the decisions in the budget, and I'll recap them for you that night, but you've made all your decisions, and the Justice Center was the last piece, so there isn't anything unless you have something. We always look forward to your presentation on the budget. Yeah, and I, actually, the question I had, uh, I have one question about the budget, and that is when, when will the governing body be receiving our advanced copies of the budget books so that we can have those to look through? You're not going to love my answer. We're grinding it as fast as we can because I simply wasn't able to do two copies, two versions of the budget book. Okay. And there was more than one change involved if it didn't pass. So we're on it. Soon. Okay. As soon, soon as possible would be That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Cheryl Harrison. -Lee. I do have a few things for you. First, I'd like to talk about um, a meeting with the Johnson County um, Executive Airport um, Director. We met with them to talk about our water agreement. We sell water to the New Century Airport. And one of the things as they continue to expand and look at economic development opportunities was our ability to 
continue to supply water for them and perhaps increase that. Um, one of the things we shared with them is the capital improvement element that will be coming to you next month for approval. It's gone to the Planning Commission and they are looking to have us amend the agreement so that we can sell some additional gallons of water to them. So more to come on that. Just wanted to give you a heads up that you'll be seeing the capital improvement element as well as that agreement um, next month. In addition to that, while we're on water, I'll talk about another water item. Um, we had an opportunity, I had an opportunity to work with um, the water district along with our utilities director about a memorandum of understanding. You will recall that the city had an agreement with them where we really um, looked at water for our areas that we would annex and provided that opportunity to the water district. We've had an opportunity to talk with them about an exchange as we look at continuing to develop um, areas for economic development and we're prepared to bring forward a, an exchange that we think you'll be very pleased with that would really be a win-win and we're looking to bring that agreement to you next month. Um, That's great to hear. If not sooner. We That's may have an opportunity to, to bring it next <laughs> meeting. And then finally just um, along with the chief just kind of thank you for your support for um, the Justice Center. It's been a little bit of a journey from the feasibility study to the purchase of the land to the final capstone project, which is the approval, um, and thank you to the voters for supporting that for your journey that we've had with the Justice Center. Well, very good. Uh, does council have anything for staff? We'll start with the council president. Yeah, um, a few of these uh, taken care of and knocked out during other discussions, but uh, uh, we have an ADA meeting coming up on August 17th at 7 p.m. Just wanted to let the people know about that. Um, that's our ADA committee, and uh, when we talk about accessibility issues and walkability and all those different aspects of, of civic life, uh, quality of life issues for the disabled, that's where we discuss those. So that's here in the, in the council chambers uh, that evening. Um, or no, it's not. It's in the senior center now, isn't it? I think. Senior center. My it's apologies. Your, it's your committee. It's a, I don't yeah, it's a, it's a senior center. I, I think that there's another committee here that meets that it's same evening. Moment. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm 40, almost 48. I'm I'm feeling it. Um, uh, there's there was a discussion earlier tonight, and and this is something I don't even that we as a city can do much of in terms of a binding type of uh, deal with with the county on this whole uh, cold storage facility. Um, item and this is something that I know that we've uh, uh, to be honest with you I didn't really have it on my radar screen it wasn't wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, disseminated to myself um, and I don't know if anybody else from the governing body had known about this before this evening uh, so that to me that's a little distressing to begin with because if there are emergency uh, issues you know around a, a potential emergency response we need to know about that um, and our local you know police department and uh, Fire District 1 would be the first responders for any kind of issue or incident over at, uh, over at the Air Center. So that, that concerns me right off the bat. Um, and uh, uh, is there anything that we could do, with, like a resolution uh, stating the sense of the body or something like that, that we would be able to forward to the county commission <coughs> regarding this if we decided to go in that direction? I mean, I'm just probing right now. Yeah, I, I mean, you can certainly pass a expressing or your oh, they were I'm sure and so they were just approving a site otherwise um, because it's it's uh, in the count there if it, if there was rezoning decision that public hearing would be that important. well but not only that but um, different than the zoning statutes for cities you go beyond 200 feet you go out a thousand feet in unincorporated areas of, of the county so that would have been encompassed a good portion of that so certainly a portion of the city and there's some city owned properties you know there's things if there was a zoning decision that you could look at a protest petition and things of that nature but but uh, short of formal action, you know, just a resolution um, 
basically expressing whatever this council's opinion is? Well, I, I mean, personally, there's a couple of things that just stick out to me like a sore thumb. One is, you know, the issue with the with the annex, you know, the, the, the jail annex, which is literally, what, a thousand feet away. feet away from that particular location. And then also the fact that the city government was not informed or consulted. Uh, prior to a vote, um, that that really concerns me, because uh, we could have had a little bit of an opportunity to weigh in and maybe uh, have some polling of some lo local residents near that location. Um, the fact that that didn't happen is is uh, is dismaying to say the least, because we are the one that we are the municipality that's the most directly affected by that. So. You know what, I, I just thought of something else and I'd have to go back and, and visit it because I, I was unaware of the situation before tonight as well. You know, we do have, um, we are parties to the overlay district out at the airport and so there's comprehensive zoning. Yes. Um, and so w we are party to that. So I, I could look at uh, potentially what remedies the, the city might have as, as part of the approval process as part of that. Um, kind of cooperative arrangement we have with the county out of New Century. Um, if I may, before sure. before we sure. um, you know do any legal study on it, wouldn't wouldn't it be appropriate to have maybe the chief and the fire department I agree. Um, take a look and make sure there's actually there's a real threat here? Um, I mean, uh, not that they're not that the, the the good gentleman that stood up and gave us a briefing this um, this evening wasn't telling us everything but there may be more to it than, than what we realize so I'd like to know the depth of it and what the threat is yeah. have a real good definition and then and then see what legal recourse we have after that well I think planning and engineering at the county offices probably have the information that yeah. that, that our folks need and and yes if they uh, I know that the, the gentleman hadn't talked with Sheriff Hayden yet but um, I'm sure he could be looped in easily enough but uh, Chief, that's something that you can make happen. Okay. Yeah. So I'm looking at some 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 papers right now from this is from Hartford's Hartford Steam Boiler, uh, James Brogan. Again, this is stuff that I just I just perused because I didn't know anything about this until this evening. Um, ammonia refrigeration and cold storage uh, facilities, particularly large cold storage facilities, um, there is a there is a uh, a chance of leakage. Uh, probably 5% of ammonia refrigerant is lost on an annual basis um, through evaporation and other means. Uh, so it, it, it definitely is, 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 a, is a concern, and it's a concern amongst the industry. What they're talking about here is, you know, having highly trained staff, uh, codes and standards, qualified uh, operators, uh, making sure you have a comprehensive emergency response plan for uh, these facilities. So obviously there is a concern here. The question is, what's the depth of it, as you said, Lee? And also, and this kind of that tells me so the second point we need desperately an emergency response coordination strategy in this community that is that is integrated between <laughs> the county mean? I'm sorry uh, it's my turn to steal your thunder now right? <laughs> between between the county between the city uh, government and uh, uh, the fire district and the county um, to be able to pull these agencies together into a and, and to create an integrated um, tier one tier two tier three response uh, plan and strategy. This isn't the only cold storage facility that's coming into this community. There's another very large cold storage facility going in on the north end of the tracks over at the Kansas, uh, at the logistics parking uh, over on over at Edgerton. So, again, there are houses within a, half, a mile and a half of that facility. So this is not just a, a, an isolated incident, and not, and not just that, but also the fact that the intermodal itself is a terrorist target. It's 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 a it's a transcontinental um, port. It is a, um, it is, there, there's definitely opportunity there and, and security uh, concerns that are in that facility. So we have to be able to, uh, to have an emergency response for that. And so I would say that we need to get together with our partners, uh, the fire district and the county, to make sure that we are covered on that. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, if you just waited for my council yeah. updates, you know. Oh, well, yeah. can, I, can I say something? I, I can't read minds yet. From the business sure. out there um, specifically. Yeah. So uh, Commissioner Brown said that there were public hearings specifically on this cold storage, okay. both for the Board of County Commissioners and for the Airport Commission. We all know how public hearings sometimes happen. So I, I would just say that maybe we need to reach out and determine are there methods that we can get 
some information in the forefront now because I mean if I were them I'd say listen we did what we were supposed to do nobody came forward and, and maybe people did I, I'm not saying they did it but it would appear that that notification was sent the meetings were held and and the decision was made so maybe we as a council for things that are impacting us need to have better visibility I to some of those things coming totally yeah. agree and so. totally agree here's here's the other thing I mean we I, I'm glad to get the public input whenever we can uh, but this was Mr. Jensen and all the, the, the folks that came and spoke uh -huh. uh, is one side of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we can get, maybe it's just a letter that uh, somebody could read into the record, but maybe we could get a response from, from the county regarding uh, their thoughts. Uh, <coughs> I believe it passed unanimously through the yes, airport commission mm -hmm. and the county commission. So uh, they must have come to that opinion for some good reason so Steve anything else um, the only other thing is uh, I got a uh, an inquiry from a constituent uh, that was uh, uh, that was awakened um, in uh, to the sound of her curb being uh, being demolished uh, and uh, they weren't able to get their car out for a period of time, and they needed to uh, have someone come in and my move the move the vehicle. And I just wanted to know if there was a way that we could have better advance notice for any kind of curb or gutter work in neighborhoods where there's where that kind of work's going to be taking place, so that people don't have their car stranded. So, I believe all that's supposed to be taken care of, but maybe we need to impress upon the contractors yeah. that they should endeavor and maybe follow up a little bit more after and maybe yeah. follow up afterwards I agree uh, I'm sure Tim you can pass that along correct okay. That's uh, Christina um, I just have a couple of things um, Tim can you talk a little bit we I, I think most of us have seen or heard complaints about uh, <clears throat> specifically ADA violations during some of the construction that's happening so can you talk a little bit about what the city's responsibility is in those regards how quickly do, do we go and um, uh, audit for enforcement of those and how what what what's our recourse with the construction company when those ADA violations occur Well, first of all, the, um, the traffic control for pedestrians and vehicles is always the responsibility of the contractor to put out and maintain. Um, in a perfect world, we would uh, be able to go out and inspect and make sure it was there um, you know, before they started construction. Unfortunately, you know, this is a busy time of year, you know, not to make excuses, but it's just, uh, I think, a matter of fact, it's, it's tough to be in many different places. Contractors are moving around and, and, sh and shifting their work. So once we find out, um, then we notify the contractor and, and tell them, okay, here's, here's what you're missing. Here's what needs to be done. Um, the bigger picture on that, the manual of uniform traffic control devices is what our industry follows. And, uh, and they do require um, detours for uh, vehicles and pedestrians. So those are the um, standards uh, that when the plans are put together that, that we meet. So, okay, so, so if there's a violation we, we determine, what, is there a time frame that they have to fix that? Is there a standard or is it? I wouldn't say there's a standard. I mean, it's up to, our inspectors have relationships with the contractors and they, and I mean, they tell them something like that happens they would expect, I mean, typically that day to have it fixed. Okay. And um, if they don't, you know, then we we take it to the next step. You know, we'll stop work or you know whatever we feel is necessary to to get the work done properly. Okay. Um, the other thing regarding the signs. Um, first, I appreciate Mr. Quarter's comments because I, I do, and, and not blaming staff because I do understand that that happens often. Um, and this particular item, you know, was a unanimous decision by the council to put the new sign policy in place. Um, and, and I, for one, can say that this particular situation was one that I never thought would come up. So um, I support um, coming up with a solution for this. I understand that coming up with the solution could also bring 
issues that you know other people may find offensive um i i personally am not while i appreciate mr quarters offer solutions i don't think that anybody should have to pay to have something in their yard like that um i i would I, I don't know what the answer is, but but I do believe that, and I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I, for one, think that this is a little extreme. So, and, and we, like I said, we created that. So, however we have to, whatever we need or solutions you have that we could do to fix this, I think um, I would be very supportive of. Well, well I, I think that, that you, you, you touched on a really good point, uh, Christine, and that is, you know, what is, what is, what is a sign which would be usually used to promote or solicit or anything like that versus yard art or decorations. And we don't have anything in the code, do we, regarding yard art, do we, or anything like that, or, or decorative type of displays? You're correct. There is, there, we have not tried to define yard art because that would be a pretty tremendously long definition. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's it's, e it's easier to yeah. it's easier to exclude uh, items when you're regulating than it is to be inclusive. <laughs> um, Always is. <laughs> but but to try and to try and do something like that, I, I do want to make a couple of quick comments because I'm I haven't heard anything from you folks, but we've had other questions. Mm -hmm. um, in a, in an appeal process for this, mm -hmm. this type of appeal goes to the BZA. It, it, if so for a very a, a zoning variation or for a, a variance this doesn't come to you it goes to the BZA correct so if that was to be the approach that we were to take we would have to we we could in, initiate a BZA review and they could review it and see what solutions they could bring to the fore for you uh -huh. uh, other than that we have to go back and modify the code correct and that's not going to be as you've been through this process several times it's we're, we're, you can't please everybody yep. but i would tell you that the current sign definitions that we have really are the best and most accurate definitions of what a sign is because a sign as we know looking at handicap signs doesn't necessarily have verbiage on it and since we no longer can zone or excuse me since we no longer can regulate based on content we can only base our sign regulations on size, location, coloration, uh -huh. other things like this that have to do with the purpose of the sign, not what the sign contains. Correct. So the sign violation in this case is not what's on it. No. It's it's too big and we don't allow big signs in neighborhood neighborhood areas. They can have a two by two sign free of charge as long as they want. There's no time limit on it. When you get bigger than that, then we start limiting the time those signs can be in place. Uh, the reason that we talked about, he brought up the fact that they could have two signs. We were trying to make it easier for people to have a sign maybe in the front yard and the backyard or if they're on a corner on whatever. Sure. And then the time limit just gets cut down by the number of signs you have. So the 90 days for two is 45 for each sign okay. or whatever. So there are variations on the themes we've tried to, and you, and you folks, reviewed and tried to make our sign ordinance much more accommodating mm -hmm. uh, and that's not to say that it'll ever be perfect but we're happy to take it back to the to the planning commission or to the bza or or look at both situations and see what kind of recommendations we can come <laughs> up with for you and we've already checked in olathe and overland park and other places and our sign code is basically identical yeah. in all regards sure. in that particular issue uh, and like we said, the re you know spend their X number of time, whatever that is, and it's not been a problem. It's true. We don't go out looking for those things, but when we get the complaint, we have to respond. Understood. Can, can I just add? Uh, yeah. So the BZA, unlike the Planning Commission, their scope of review is extremely narrow. They look at one of two things in this situation. The first thing that they would look at is whether a variance is warranted, and then they have to consider five factors that are laid out under Kansas law and also under our code at 17.03.090B. Those factors, they have to meet every one of those factors, and if they miss on any one of the factors, the BZA is supposed to deny it.
Yeah. One of the factors is that people, it, uh, that's very difficult legally to meet, is that this causes an undue hardship on the property owner not to grant the variance. Extremely difficult to meet that legal definition. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other piece that the BZA could consider is um, whether the code enforcement officer, um, if there is uh, a believed ambiguity in their interpretation of the code, so one thing that came up was, does this qualify as a sign mm -hmm. within the meaning of our code? That's and, and the BZA does have quite a bit of leeway in interpretation and application of the code. Mm -hmm. And um, if they come back and say, you know what, we don't think this is a sign, something promoting a business or an institution. Um, so, so that is a potential uh, remedy. I, I will tell you that I think that if, if the BZA is doing and, and applying the factors as they should, it's very, very difficult to get a, a, a zoning variance approved. And so that's the narrow scope of what the BZA does. If you're looking for kind of, hey, let's kick this around, let's come up with good solutions that we can look at the code, that really, that's the planning commission that, that needs to look at it in that respect. Yeah. I, I, I well, mean, I ahead, agree with that. I, I just, I, I would hate, since the VZA <laughs> really acts in a quasi-judicial, you know, that to me that's limited in, in what we can do. I, I would agree. rather that we do something with the Planning Commission, but then also in, in this case, um, if the Planning Commission, which I would assume would grant an, a, an exception or a waiver, how, how do we change, use that information from the Planning Commission so that we don't have to keep doing this over and over again? Okay. So so how do we take whatever, however they interpret this, whether it's not promoting a business or it's yard art, you know, wh whatever that is, I believe that we need to make changes based on that and so that we don't, every time somebody wants to put something in their yard, they have to go before the Planning Commission for a variance. That I would just agree. doesn't I make would sense agree. to me. So. Yep. That, that's all I would ask, is that we get something back to the Planning Commission, use this as an example, bring back recommendations to make changes to, to do that and, and move forward. Well, then understand that maybe they will bring back uh, recommendations to make changes, but then again... Maybe they won't. Maybe, right. and, maybe exactly. they do not. I, you know, it's when I was looking all this up and I was looking back through, through meeting minutes, uh, you know, uh, Councilmember Moore actually acknowledged acknowledged the amount of work this represented, and stated it is a tremendous accomplishment, and lots of activity and meeting after meeting. He thanked everyone that participated in this, especially the Planning Commission, and the. I don't want to set a unrealistic expectation for anybody, because we've heard a report already this evening that this wouldn't have been legal under the previous it sign code or land development code. And I'm just like everybody else, uh, you know, who here's a Royals fan? I mean, seriously. <laughs> Christy, raise your hand, you're a Royals fan for Pete's sake. I mean, we're all Royals fans, we love the Royals. I mean, I, you know, I during the playoff runs, you couldn't see it, couldn't go on any of my social media, it wasn't all over. I, I get it. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, this is this is a, a heavy lift, and I don't want to yeah. to mislead anybody into thinking that that action will necessarily be swift or come out in your favor. Uh, I would like to see that maybe it does, because I'm such a Royals fan, and because I've seen the sign before, right. and I take no exception with it. So. But uh, this is this is something that a lot of time and energy has been been spent on and, and, and rules and regulations published. And so, uh, yeah, I, on, I was going to say, that there are very important rules uh, or, or reasons why those rules exist, why these codes exist. Mm -hmm. um, it gives us it gives us something, a, a construct to work within um, because we all live so close together. Our houses are all next door, next door to one another and these codes allow us some kind of recourse. If, you're, if your next door neighbor decides It'll be really cool to have this really offensive picture, sign, whatever you, you know, whatever you want to imagine. Um, 
you you as a, a property owner next to that uh, you're trying to sell your home uh, you might have a problem <laughs> uh, your home might not be worth as much or you may not get any takers at all and you're gonna have a problem so these codes exist for that reason so I've seen it over and over again all the comments going back and forth on Facebook and there's a lot of well it's my property I can do what I want um, yeah yeah there's there is that and we all feel that way but really when you get right down to it it just can't work that way because we we live too too close together. It works that way in the country. If you, you know, if you live outside of a, an incorporated area, paint a big old mural on your barn. And, yeah, you can paint. Yeah, you see it all over murals <coughs> on barns. You see signs on on yeah. rooftops, all kinds of stuff. But since we live t together like this, um, it's it's just not it's just not practical. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's why these codes are there, and um, and that's and the reason they're so difficult to write. And what I was alluding to in the, in, uh, before and how, how long it takes that uh, the Planning Commission and everybody to, to work on these things is is because we have to n navigate this minefield of individual property rights and, and, and individual standard. Uh, feelings of, of uh, this is this is my property and and you can't tell me what to do on it you know it's a narrow minefield we all have to kind of you know tiptoe across to kind of get to some kind of construct that we can work with and and, uh, and it, that construct has to take into account our constitutional rights as well. And exactly. I, I made a post on Facebook kind of alluding to this, that, that your First Amendment, um, while it does, it, it does basically say you can say whatever you want in public and, and you can paint whatever you want on the side of your house, uh, because you live next door to a, your next door neighbor, uh, that you, gotta, you, have to you have to respect his rights as well. Your, your rights and his rights um, sort of intersect and you gotta find some way to work together and that's what these codes do. Yeah. They kind of put this construct together so you can work together with, with your neighbor. <laughs> and um, so that's what, I, you know, mm -hmm. that's no. all I wanted to say. I just no. wanted to make sure that that got out there that there's there's a reason for this stuff. It, it's, and and we, all have, uh, we all have a say and that's what this podium is for. Um, uh, and to, to stand up and, and say, I want the code changed so I can have this kind of a sign or that yeah. kind of a sign. But you also have to keep in mind that the First Amendment applies in that case, the, the case that uh, was mentioned earlier, um, uh, the city of Gilbert uh, thought that they could, uh, they could regulate the content on a sign. They yeah. thought that they could say, you can have a royal sign, but you can't have this church sign. Um, or you can have this sign, but not that sign. And, and our code, is very specific in terms of just the sign. It just defines what a sign is, the dimensions of a sign, how long you can have the sign out, uh, where you can put the sign, how you can mount the sign. Um, it doesn't talk about the content, which is why this is this 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 is a real sticky wicket because we all <laughs> love the Royals. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I and I think that uh, one of the things that that you know can we can we can we figure out you know can we do a little redefinition of what a sign is? Absolutely. Can we tinker maybe with the dimensions? Absolutely. Can we tinker with the longevity for the length of time that a sign can be put up? Absolutely. But anytime you're talking about content or trying to say, well, this is, this is a royal sign. Come on, everyone's like, well, of course, we all love the royals. You know, but, <laughs> but, but, but the, the, the point is, you know, if we, if we open it up, if we open up the sign code to include, you know, uh, royal signs of any dimension or anything like that, now you end up with the potential of a, you know, a, a very offensive content um, or, or signs that, you know, would still fit under the code, but would be something that would be very detrimental to the community. Yeah. And actually, I, I'd like to piggyback on that, but I'd like to get away from the very offensive content mm -hmm. portion and just say, if somebody moved in next to me and put up a, a sign that was by code too big, and that sign said, Free puppies and cats, fresh litter every weekend. I'd probably have a problem with that sign. You'd have a cow. Right? Uh, I mean, you know, that's that 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 would be an awful lot of. I, I mean, it doesn't have to be worst yeah, case fine. scenario. No. Nope. Uh, you, you know, your kids can come play on my trampoline. I mean, I, I might have a problem with that. So yeah. uh, these are just things to consider. Uh, with regard to enforcement, and I think that this is where we haven't, you know, I think that we need to give the chief direction on this. I think while we're reviewing what, we, what the art of the possible is on this ordinance, what does the governing body want to do with regard to this particular case? Because there is go, there is an enforcement component here, and right now we, I think we need to probably give direction to the 
police chief as to how we're going to let this play out. Well, we have to change something. We can't make, you know. Uh, because right now they're under a, they're under a cease and desist letter. So right. I think uh, we probably have a better chance of putting that on hold while we look at all things. I, is that something we could do, Ryan? Put, which way? Can we put kind of suspend put, put the cease and desist order on hold? I mean, put their you know. Basically, the the, uh, the enforcement side on hold while we look at the code, so they don't. I mean, without actually, you know, telling them to remove it in the interim, is that you can? Um, you can certainly do that, um, but where it becomes sticky is if we start doing them. Case by case content. Yes. Well, situation. I, I, this would be a, a unique because it's out there, right? We how many other citations like this have we written, Chief? No, it would have to be for the whole cycle. Right. Correct. We'd have to yeah, we'd, we'd have, have to, to suspend for, <laughs> for residential properties. For residential fixed, properties. Fixed, fixed signs. Yeah. I mean, we, we suspended it the last time right. when we were waiting for yeah, a review. Yeah, I'm in favor of that. That's yeah. Right. All right. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Larry's got a finger. Larry Powell. <laughs> yes, Larry. <laughs> uh, the word citation was used. The cease and desist letter is not a citation. Right. There's a difference. Okay. Yes, it's a cease and I just wanted letter. you yes. to be aware that there's not been a ticket issued, so there's not a court action okay. started. What you have is the opportunity for the individual to correct the violation. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the time frame for that correction is basically ticking and and that's that's the situation you have right now with your with your letter and the question is can we stop the clock yes. or pause it while we continue this work so uh let's see i believe we've got consensus to uh pause enforcement on this particular section of the sign zones uh, wall signs on residences uh for the time being while it's studied by the planning commission larry timeout signal I, i'm sorry what you're doing now is you're making a suggestion or a motion starting towards a motion that would keep us from enforcing that particular section across correct. the city that's correct i i would suggest that rather than that you make a motion that the cease and desist letter be held in abeyance until such time as the planning commission can take action or bring action to you, and then you're only addressing that letter. I don't know. I like the idea of letting the whole city I don't think crazy with signs. <laughs> Steve, yeah. Chief, I Chief's got it. I think he's worried about enforcement. <laughs> yeah, so. that's, yeah. that's the we're, we're back to the same thing. If case by case. Based. I mean, mm -hmm. exactly. We, there's no. If I use that discretion, we're still back to the content-based thing. If I don't do it, I'd rather do it across the board. Well, I think we'd be opening yeah. ourselves up to a possible legal issue. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Cheryl, Ryan, are we going to need a, a motion and a second to send this back to the Planning Commission, or can we just send it back to the Planning so, Commission? So, um, to start the process, well, I mean, the, the, to start the process of a code amendment, either the governing body or the Planning Commission has to initiate it. So you could make a motion to uh, initiate um, the process of the Planning Commission to review and recommendation. Yeah, mm -hmm. review and make, make a recommendation. You can do that by motion right now. Do we have to cite the specific uh, section of code to be sent back? I've actually the more specific you, be, you can be, I the better. You were. <laughs> <laughs> Preparation. Of course. You know. Um, mm -hmm. So 10-1A, okay. so I would be, I would entertain a motion to uh, stop enforcement and pause, pause, pause enforcement, uh, including the cease and desist letter for Ms. Whitson and Mr. Crater? Quarter. 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 Uh, in regards to the sign standards, chapter 17-10, 
and uh, wall signs, table 10 1. Subsection A. Subsection A. Yeah. And I'll, I'll move. I'd entertain a motion. Yeah, so second. Shoot. Uh, Harrison, that uh, we do that. I'm going to try and repeat it. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstention? Reprieve. No promises, but reprieve. Yeah. So will this, uh, will this, now, do we need to do we need to take motion to uh, a motion to send it back to the planning commission, or can we just tell Larry put it on the uh, agenda for the next uh, planning commission meeting? Which is review. Right. The motion that was just made was that a motion to initiate mm -hmm. changes to the code? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's all you need to do. To okay. Get, okay. Very good then. So will this be on the next? Planning Commission meeting, which is we'll we'll start the initiation to that, but um, the next meeting is September that we can get it on. We can't get it on the August agenda, okay? Okay, because of the public hearing requirements. There, yeah, yeah, it's going to take it's going to take a while, but the sign's yeah. going to stay up while it while we go through the process. Shoot, even if it's an unfavorable, chances are you're going to get through the end of the season. <laughs> they us drag us out till October. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Shoot, if they drag maybe it out end of October. Yeah, if, if they if they drag it out in planning commission, maybe November. Yeah. and I think that's what we're all hoping for. So, all right. okay. I have one more. One item. more. I just want to recap what what is happening with uh, Mr. Hutchins' ask regarding the exemption for farm trucks for the truck route, Chief. You're going to go back and look from an enforcement perspective whether you feel utilizing that information is effective well my understanding is they can use the most direct route but i know there's exceptions in the code for farm vehicles and i'm not exactly sure what that is so i'll go back and look okay and then i'll okay. contact him and let him know okay great thanks Chief. great thank thanks. you lee okay well um our first thing i wanted to bring up was uh mr heath freeman uh mentioned that he would like us to look into Purple Heart Day or uh, Purple Heart uh, City I guess I'm mm -hmm. sorry, uh, in honor of Purple Heart Day and other things so can we uh, get a consensus to direct staff to look into what that would yeah. take yeah. and make us a recommendation I think so I would be in total yes. agreement that's not a no it's all across the desk okay um, second thing on the go golf course I just wanted to make a comment um, the uh, the presentation was awesome. Lots of information there. Uh, really good information. It seemed very objective, um, very honest, and, and I really appreciated that. Um, the uh, one thing that I would like to point out, though, is in 2015, we all sat up here and passed um, a sales tax extension from the previous sales tax that we had to pay for the park and the pool, the uh, celebration park and the pool. We passed that extension to pay for street maintenance, something that should be paid for all day, general every day, fund. out yeah. of the general fund. Correct. From our property taxes. Yep. So I just want to make that clear before we make, you know, we talk about uh, what we're going to do with this golf course and spend millions of dollars to build a golf course and, uh, and all this other stuff. Uh, the other thing is, I've heard over and over and over and over again from citizens that we need a, we need a community center. So, I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, we got a piece of we got a piece of property. Currently, it sits as a uh, dilapidated golf course. Um, citizens uh, that I, that I speak with on a pretty regular basis all say we want a community center. Uh -huh. So, maybe one day we can put that together, those two things together. Um, but uh, so that, that's all I'll say about the golf course. Um, I also had on my list about the uh, the, the notice. Um, we need to do so, we need to do something to, to make sure that uh, citizens are getting notified when work is being done right in front of their home, yeah. uh, especially work that's going to keep them trapped in their home, <laughs> not able to yeah. drive out of the driveway. Um, and uh, one other one that I that I heard of uh, was uh, the 11 or 12 feet of of yard that was removed from the one citizen's. Uh, front yard right over here on Main Street um, with no notice and no uh, nothing I mean they removed the, the sidewalk and you know a bunch of this grass and everything and and uh, there wasn't a letter on the door or anything so um, 
it seems like we've got a little bit of a problem here. Yeah, well, it sounds like our contractors need to be more diligent. I'm sure that our public works staff's going to. Are we doing door hangers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. going to, to lean on them. <laughs> well, if, if I could just clarify a little bit, I, I think the projects we're talking about are uh, private projects on public improvements. Uh, uh -huh. When we do a public improvement project um, <laughs> of our own, street project, whatever, that's one of the first things we do. We door hangers or we go out and, and meet face to face to talk to people so but there but there obviously is a disconnect on those type of projects um, you know that, that maybe the contractor doesn't realize he needs to be notified or he's been told and, and it just doesn't happen but um, <coughs> we understand yeah that it, it needs to be improved and addressed can, can we do something with these contractors to say they need to provide before they take one action toward doing their work, they have to provide positive confirmation to whether to you, Tim, to say we've notified property owners. Sure, we could do that. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I guess something. that's just to me one way to hold them accountable and make sure that, and, and it doesn't require you guys to have to chase something down. Um, one other thing uh, I was gonna, I was gonna talk about um, along with the, the, the mini speech I gave on on why we have goats, <laughs> was, I wasn't planning to is, do that. By is the way. this another mini speech? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the uh, I, I wanted to kind of go over the complaint-driven codes mm -hmm. enforcement uh, model that we yeah. currently operate on. That's not all only uh, complaint-driven, um, as the chief told us this, this evening. Um, so. Uh, what kind of investment do we need to make in order to make everything? I mean, because one, uh, you know, a lot of citizens are complaining that well, this sign was up for two years and nobody complained, and and now all of a sudden I have to take it down. Yep. Um, others, uh, you know, other complaints that we even heard this evening are well, there's code violations all over the place. There's you know some over here, some over there, and why are you picking on me? Um, that kind of thing. So there's two models. There's the complaint-driven model where. You know, we just, it's anything goes until somebody, file, you know, somebody uh, calls the cops. <laughs> and then there's, then there's the, uh, the other model where, the proactive model, the proactive model where we have someone uh, on the city uh, payroll uh, burning the city's gas, driving a city vehicle uh, with a clipboard and, a, and a, a tape measure, going around sticking it in your grass and go, oh, you're, uh, you're a half inch over. And we're going to have to cite you for that. Um, there's that model. So um, I prefer the former. You know, the, I like the complaint-driven thing. Um, you know, and I've, I've, I have made light of it in, in social media that, you, can, you know, we could, you, theoretically, you can move that sign around and uh, from house to house, and it would just have to be somebody complaining, you know, and, um, and, and, uh, and that sign gets to say, stay up wherever it, you know, wherever it ha happens to be. Um, that's one scenario um, under this complaint driven system that, that uh, is sort of a, I see as a positive um, and the other is that obviously we get some cost savings out of it we're not paying a, that salary for that person to drive around and and look for violations and uh, and, and all of our code enforcement is done by one individual right um, a, 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 a more proactive approach would require a whole team of, of, of people sure and would. and vehicles uh, running around because you know there's a lot of you know, we all know there are a lot of code violations everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it, that would keep a couple of people busy. Well, we're um, in a city of 22,000 people. I mean, that's that yeah. they're going to have a lot of violations. And, 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 and the, you know, people talk about fairness and they talk about, you know, um, you know inconsistency of, of, of enforcement. Uh, that's what happens when you have a limited resource pool that's having to enforce a, 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 a pretty significantly large municipal code. Even if we've tried to streamline it and make it more friendly, it's still a large code. So you're always going to have this this tension of you know whether or not something is is equitable or not. And the only way you're going to be able to fix that is by either <laughs> throwing out large portions of the municipal code to make it a truly you know objectively enforceable. Or increasing your staff so much, you're going to be paying a lot more in taxes. I don't think that that's necessarily an alternative. Either one of those, one, either one of those alternatives we want to utilize. So, you know, one last argument for uh, the complaint-driven 
um, codes enforcement is uh, BTK um, down in Wichita was a codes enforcement officer <laughs> in a. BTK. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> and that oh, was man. Uh, I know I, I, I just but um, <laughs> that was done in. Uh, I mean that that, that uh, city had a uh, proactive uh, codes enforcement model. Yes, so. Still does. It still does. Yeah. 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 But not BTK. I, you know, I, if you go back and look at the, the last three ETC satisfaction surveys, uh -huh. nothing is more polarizing than code enforcement. Right? Uh -huh. It's like half the people think that it's everything's okay, and the other half of the people think it stinks. And it's probably the half the people that make the complaints, and then the, <laughs> the other half are the, the, the people that have been cited. Exactly. And, and, but when you compare what we do here in Gardner, Against the national average, I mean that's one of the ones where we, where we're figuring lower, but actually it's right around the national average anyway. Yeah. So, uh, code enforcement is a double-edged sword in just about any community that's out there. Yep. So, that's all I have. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Todd. Uh, no, well, you guys pretty much covered everything I wanted to cover. So, that's not nice sure. Thank you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Rich. Um, real quick, um, I want to thank everybody for coming. It's awesome seeing this many people here, and we got about sixty people watching online, which is pretty cool too. So, uh, I think we might want to look at and correct me if I'm wrong. That there is ways we can live stream this mm -hmm. every meeting. So I think it would be beneficial if we looked at live streaming it with the current technology we have. YouTube has that that ability. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of citizens who would really appreciate the opportunity to be able to do that. So, um, first thing on my list, uh, I'm going to start with this uh, plan, the cold and freezing plan. I'm going to do my part to call the uh, commissioners and talk to them. But I, I, to me, this sounds like the perfect thing for out uh, a Sunflower Army Ammunition Plan, or the former, we you know, it's our Sunflower Army Ammunition, because it's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, and working. there's, you're not going to contaminate <laughs> anything, let's face it. It's, well, there's there's a little bit out there. There's a water plant out there and some other stuff. Yeah, already, so. but the other issue is that they're obviously putting a cold storage facility in there because they're in proximity to the intermodal. No, I understand. I and mean, no, it's not that far. Well, yeah. proximity to the new Amazon fresh. And, right. and, and so, the Amazon fresh. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do my due diligence, though, and I'm going to call and talk to everybody. And for what it's worth, I, I was... A little upset we didn't get told about it, but here again, it's not in our city, so <coughs> I can understand why they wouldn't do that. So, um, and uh, oh, on the golf course, can we get the um, your slideshow that you did? Can, can you submit that to the yeah, city minister? Oh, you, oh, awesome! Because Great. I think there's a lot of people who probably can't see it on the YouTube video, you know, because it's so small. So if we can get that and post it, that would be fantastic. I think there's a lot of information on there people need to see. It's one so, of the better presentations I've seen. Yes, and it really, I mean, us. those numbers were awesome. And, and yeah. uh, I would just, those are big numbers. So I appreciate your honesty and everything. Uh, it was a, a fantastic presentation. So uh, I'm going to start down my list of stuff, and I'm going to probably go over a few things because... Uh, there's people that were asking stuff during the presentation about Madison Street was the first thing out of my list. Just for everybody at home, um, Tim said maybe five weeks. We don't know. We're going to try to get the weather, um, but we are we did approve that tonight. So uh, five weeks uh, it'll maybe be done by then. So um, the other council members we talked about uh, curves. I don't know if any of you heard that. Uh, online signs. Uh, oh yeah, the signs on the way into town. Um, I got a <laughs> Facebook message, and I'm not sure how this happened, yellow but uh, white. they are uh, yellow on white, and you can't really see anything. So I don't know what our plan is to rectify that because like, we got this awesome Power G that kind of faded away. So uh, have you guys had any discussions on that? Can we, can we outline it? Uh, I I talked to Jody and her. In the public works, you put the sign up, and really the the two options are to replace the sign um, and and do something so it does stand out, or the cheaper option would be to look at it. is there is there some way to outline? Well, yeah, I think a black outline would be yeah. a blue so, outline or something so would be. That's the first choice, but then he's looking into that and getting some prices to okay. see if that's possible. All right, that'd be great because I mean, here we did really do all that, and then some <laughs> citizen goes, "I can't even read it." I'm like, oh, it's 
hard to read. So it's yeah. worse at night because oh, the headlights you right, can't right. it's completely whited out. So um, sign on the deck. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, you know, I'm the I'm the biggest personal property rights advocate up here. And I mean, if if it were up to me, you, if your neighbor had something offensive, it would just be too bad. So um, I <laughs> that's where I stand on this issue because it's you know. When the city starts writing me a check, I'll start letting you tell me how to do things. So, um, but that's that's where I stand personally on it. So people have been asking me, and I figured I'd tell you. So, um, uh, the other day I requested, uh, well, actually citizens contacted me about the um, your event, Mayor Morrow, on next week, or I guess it's later this week on Friday. Uh, Thursday. Thursday with the senior center. Everyone's and, welcome to come. Right. Mm -hmm. You can come. So there's this is basically I I'm not I'm not gonna bash you on it or anything. The the, the problem I had with it was it kind of puts uh, I think staff in a difficult position because you posted this event on the third at ten fifty nine AM. People started contacting me making sure that hey, did he have to pay for that? And I sent Cheryl a really nice letter saying I'm sure this is you know, I'm sure he had to pay for it. We don't give that stuff away even to, to uh, council members. I asked for the receipt. So I asked for that at 1 o'clock on the 3rd. So, And then on the uh, 4th, I got the receipt from Cheryl, which the, the 4th was the day the bill was paid. So it just looks bad. But it also puts the staff in a bad position because the reservations must be made seven days in advance and then the payments are due so I would just kind of say um, I think we need to look out for staff on things like that um, in the future so I don't want because if somebody came in and read that thing while you were not there or before any payments had been done it would have been bad for them so um, legal liability on the golf course uh, I know we've covered this before. I got an email from a constituent. Uh, I see that as a real big problem for us because here we are with codes enforcement on this sign thing. Why, I mean, have we, we haven't issued any tickets or cease and desist or fix these things for the golf course. So we really open ourselves up big time for that, don't we, Brian? Because we're basically acknowledging that this is a problem without doing anything about it, especially after the golf course um, we got that report from the USGA, all that's public. We've had this discussion many times. So, your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> what, you know, the golf course, we have, through our leasing agreement with them, they, they have exclusive use and possession of the property. Right. And so, um, so really, we're in a, even though we are owners of the property, that they are the ones who are responsible for the care and upkeep of that property. Um, and so we, we're in a situation just like we would be with the, with the private property owner of what would our liability be for um, two pieces, inspection of or failure to inspect a, a, a codes violation, that's one, or two would be uh, enforcement of or failure to enforce the law. And under the Kansas Tort Claims Act, we actually have immunity from liability uh, as a municipality for, for both of those types of activities. Um, that being said, um, you know, there's, there's nothing in our lease, and in fact, going back to uh, one of the first things that, that I ever did um, was meet with Jeff Stewart within the first couple months of when I was city attorney, and we talked about code violations out there at that time. And, and we provided notice to the property and at that time, I mean, if there are code violations, we can certainly enforce those. Um, and so, um, that, yeah, there's nothing in our lease which would preclude us from doing that. I, me personally, I think, you know, with all the dust up on the code violation on this one sign, that the worst that happened to fall off and kill somebody in their yard um, versus this where we have this public facility, I think really you need to be from my perspective, cracking down on that just because we, you know, I mean, I think everybody knows I work at Pizza Hut, but there's no way we would allow Pizza Hut to stay open if there were code violations like that because the public is in danger. So I, I don't know how we allow it at, at our own facility to continue. So any thoughts from the rest of the body on that? 
<laughs> hey, you're opening up a big old can of worms hey, I'm there, just saying, Rich. We, the law should be equally applied. I would tend to agree. I would tend to agree. If there are if there are portions of the facility that are the constitute code violation, those violations have to be re rectified. Um, I guess I guess the question is, do we shut down the golf course while we're rectifying the violation? And I, I mean, well, Ian, so so that bridge is a perfect example. Right. So do mm -hmm. we are we saying we want city resources? Because I'm assuming even if you shut down the golf course, you're still liable if somebody is out there walking around. I agree. So do we direct Parks and Rec to go out and fix that? And can we do that under the lease? Because, under the lease, yeah. Um, I, I mean, how is that handled? So do we, we pay him the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'd have to go and look at the lease, um, but I, I don't recall that we uh, at, would have a right of entry short of us terminating the lease. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are provisions in the lease that they are to operate the facility in compliance with all applicable laws at all times. Mm -hmm. So the example back in whatever it was, when did I come on, Cheryl, 13? Something like that. But uh, 13 was they were having events in a dilapidated, dilapidated structure out there, and, there, and uh, Jeff Stewart at the time was concerned about people's safety. Mm -hmm. So we did issue a cease and desist, and, and the situation was remedied. Um, that, that type of thing, you know, we'd go through a regular codes enforcement process with them. Um, you know, when we did send them a letter back then, you know, there, there was a code, there's a codes enforcement piece, then there's also a piece pursuant to the lease. We also sent them a, a notice letter under the lease, hey, you're required to operate this uh, facility in compliance with all applicable laws and our laws dictate you're compliant with code. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that, that was successful in uh, uh, obtaining compliance at that time, which is what you really want to happen. Right. I mean, that's the thing I don't want to pick up. I just, you know, yeah. Well, and I, I kind of wonder, as well as contacting Cheryl and, and, and the city attorney, if maybe that shouldn't have gone to the, the police chief as well, because code enforcement is under his domain. And while maybe somebody was just asking a, a question, they were also identifying a potential code violation mm -hmm. uh, that would probably need to be investigated. Uh, Chief, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, but we talked about this before. We talked about this several months ago, mm -hmm. and the direction that I took from Ryan is is that we didn't want to go out there and start enforcing, doing code enforcement while the lease was up in the air or while we were approaching the end of the lease. So we didn't follow up on that because this same discussion happened several months ago. If, if I said that or gave that impression, uh, that I, I apologize for that because, you know, I believe Councilman Melton's right. And, and in fact, historically, we have done this. Mm -hmm. If there are code violations out there and we know about them, we've enforced them. Just because it, they're it, a lessee it, and the, and the right. lease is not particularly enforceable on its face, we, so that doesn't mean we can't, we can suspend code enforcement action. <laughs> I, th I think the discussion, as I recall it, and you know, I, I could just be wrong about this. The, the discussion really centered around, hey, the golf course is falling into dramatic disrepair. Yep. What do we do about that? Do we send them? A, 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 and generally, and I guess I was thinking about playability conditions, trees, greens, everything that our consultant talked about, and you know. The, the discussion at that time relating to those issues was, well, our lease is up at the end of 18. We need time to figure this stuff out. Not health, safety, and life violations. So if, if, if that was the takeaway from what I was talking about, then that, that certainly was not my intent. Were there other violations that were reported? Well, that USG or USGA report had a bunch of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. several. I mean, it was yeah. it was a bunch. The I maintenance mean, shed, the there was, I mean, electrical house, too. The, I mean, it well, was just bridges. like the bridge. It was pretty. Yeah. The USGA report was a playability report for the course. We had Tim go out and inspect part of the bridges, but not all of them were viewable. 
we had Mick go out and inspect some you know aspects of the building I'm holding some of the his inspection report and it says type of inspection courtesy inspection I don't know if it needs to be defined in a different way in order to actually enforce it or not um, but I can tell you right now I'm sitting here reading one saying that entire maintenance building needs to come down yeah that's what it says structurally that's not safe so you have to realize the impact oh, yeah. of what would be about to occur if you if you say a bridge can't be crossed you've now cut off the access to two holes mm -hmm. you've basically rendered nine holes non-playable yeah. well, I think Cheryl can you follow up with staff during debrief tomorrow to see which way we need to go with this I will convene a meeting with the chief and legal and uh, parks and rec, so we can. Okay. Well, there's a way you can you can do the work on the bridge and put a temporary crossing in, even if we need to. I mean, it's not that. I mean, I, my my concern here is that health, safety, and, and 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 stability of the of the structures is paramount, because if if we have a problem out there, we're looking at a big lawsuit, because we knew about it and didn't do anything about it. And, and I, I understand that. Uh, at the same time, Parks and Rec maintenance staff are not engineers either, so Correct. we have to determine what is the actual remedy that needs to occur. Um, you know, one of the bridges in a storm, the tree fell over and bent the frame. However, we're not qualified to determine whether that frame is still structurally sound or not. And the access that Tim was able to get to was limited at best. So sure. it would take a really you know thorough inspection when everybody went out there and looked at this stuff this is all based on the premise that we were just getting an assessment of the course so you know in aspects from park park and recreation standpoint you know we're looking at it from the landlord and enforcing that kind of stuff but as for the policing power it's going to take you know those actions to be able to do that okay. all right so Ready? the next thing was uh, um, for those online I brought up an idea on the Please, you'll have to just watch the regular video. They're following them on a cheat sheet, by the way, if at home. So, um, um, and then I had a question on our chip and seal, which is, you know, here we are again. It's getting cold now, and I'm, I noticed I watched a couple of videos from last year, and it seems like two Julys in a row we have approved chip and seal, and then we get to this time of the year where it starts cooling off, and now we're done. So I'm wondering why are we continuing to. Uh, you know, uh, vote for chip and seal in July. Well, we could do it in April and then have the projects get ready to roll. And if it's a money thing, at least they'd be ready to roll in July. And what's that? Okay, so that would be my recommendation for next year. We kind of move it back in the spring. So that way when it actually is hot, we're actually, you know, it's sticking and we're not running up against the clock right now. So um, uh, salary survey follow up. Where are we at with that? We talked about that, what, a month ago or a month and a half ago, and I haven't seen anything, so. I'm meeting with Gail on Thursday or Friday. She hasn't got back with me on either day, but okay. she said she's available for both days. So. All right, well, just keep me posted because I'll be asking again, so. Uh, and then personnel policy follow-up. I think the last, we brought that, I brought that up for 12-16, so December yeah. of 2016. We've been working on a policy manual update so where are we at with that well um, we were actually um, talking about bringing it to this meeting to the work session uh, but because of the work on the um, justice center the budget the golf course it's been delayed okay. so we should bring it in a work session to get your input probably the next couple of council meetings awesome okay i'm, I'm glad right. to hear that so okay. thanks um, alan thank you alan so uh next one is uh, truth bomb question so you're probably familiar with that mayor and, and of course councilman moore is so i i have a question for you um you had a constituent ask you and it was walter about councilmember moore's I'll just read it here. Councilmember Morris written about a comb investigation and, and had this to say, to put it plainly, this mayor and city administrator working behind 
the cover of confidentiality to force the chief out, permanently, irrevocably destroy his otherwise stellar 30 year plus, or 30 plus year law enforcement career. Is this a true statement? Which then you replied, and this is on your mayor, real like Chris Morrow for mayor page, and this is Mr. Hermrick. In response to the, the questions you posed to me on Friday evening, and it says, I have not read the post that Lee Moore Gardner City Councilman has authored. And I can state without equivocation that this lengthy social media post is riddled with inaccuracies, falsehoods, and innuendo. Personnel matters are confidential. Executive sessions are entered to the sake of confidentiality. Discussing personnel matters regarding non-elected personnel outside executive sessions is irresponsible and reckless. Confidentiality protects, among other things, uh, a person's right to privacy, in which uh, is protected by the United States Constitution. For my part, I will not engage in, uh, with loose talk that has been on display since Friday evening. I will remain quiet on this matter beyond this statement. It is in the best interest of our city employees and our government organizations. And finally, uh, in nearly 22,000 residents of our governing body represents. And then sincerely, Chris Morrow. And uh, you alluded to, you posted a screenshot of it. So Mike, I, I wasn't at this meeting, so I, <laughs> I wasn't able to call in. I think we all remember that. So I, I have a question though, when it says, um, I have read the post and, uh, and uh, as authored, and I can state without equivocation, lengthy social media posts are real with inaccuracies, falsehoods, and innuendo. But then you also say, I will not engage in loose talk after that, uh, which, which is it, sir? Uh, I would like to actually know. Actually, I don't believe it's an either or question, Councilman. I'd like to know where the inaccuracies and falsehoods were because I wasn't able to attend that meeting. And I said I wasn't going to discuss it further. Because it because it is personal matters because it is there is there is confidentiality and privacy that's involved, and whatever anyone else decides that they want to do, that's entirely up to them. But I'm going to tell you again, and for the record, that I'm not going to betray any kind of confidentiality or privacy, uh, whether it's uh, personnel that I hear in communication with the city administrator or whether it's communication I hear from inside executive session. I'm not going to do it, councilman. So that's your answer. All right. Well, I, that was your chance to tell the citizens, so I guess you got that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I respect the citizens' privacy just as much as I do other members of the governing body and city staff. So the next thing is, uh, uh, our paper of record discussion is he still here? Hey, Heath. Um, I uh, I did have some information and, and I wanted to go over it on our um, poll we did. Um, Heath referenced it earlier. 239 people voted to the Gardner News was their uh, primary um, place for news. Um, none of these got 221. The Star got 86 and the legal record got two. I was surprised the legal record got that many. That is amazing. I bet our percentages are way up. So uh, over every other city. So my thought was, with only 548 people voting, and by the way, I did check on SurveyMonkey, um, and, and I don't know if anybody else ever checked this. Uh, you can vote as many times as you want on any IP if you have a different machine. So I tested it, and I voted once, and I voted once with two different machines. So if you have 12 machines in your house, which I don't think is uncommon anymore between cell phones and everything else, you can skew the votes. It doesn't require a separate machine. Right. Oh, well, there you, you go. just turn off cookies and then oh. refresh and then vote. See that? Lee Moore, times. IT guy. So, I'm not IT. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm just a normal guy that uses the internet. He just knows about cookies. Uh, and I'm, 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 the, I'm the IT guy. So, so anyway, um, but, but I eat, there's two things that I look at when I see 548 people. It's, it's, uh, Either we have a marketing problem, which I don't think we do, because Danica does a great job of getting that information out. Way to go, Danica. Um, what I do see is that the citizens really don't care. When you have 22,000 people and 548 of them choose to comment on what paper they use, it does, they don't think they really care. Uh, I was, I did ask Cheryl for a, a lot of extra information. Um, there was, and we got that whole bundle of information um, I did ask for something above and beyond, which um, 
ask for, let me see if I can find here real quick. But I did ask for specifics on the website and some other stuff. And we basically, um, Rhonda's answer, and I'm not going to quote it because I, I didn't bring that piece of paper, but it was if the Gardner Edge wants my information, they can ask me for it. And this was like, I wanted website numbers because we had asked for that, right? As body, we asked for their website traffic and everything else. And so we got one thing from April, of, between, April the, the month of April for 2017, saying 20,000 people went to their website. That, that was it. We didn't get any other really information. There's some, um, which is, you know, a decent amount. I, um, but, you know, then today we get the information from Danica. It says that KansasCity.com has 71,000 people a day. A day. Average unique visitors, 231,000. 4.68 uh, million monthly unique visitors. Two hundred and uh, I'm sorry, twenty nine point one four million page views, eight point eight nine million visits, uh, six point seven nine minutes average time on the website, three hundred twenty eight pages per visit, one hundred and ninety visits or one point nine visits per visitor. So and I'm not sure what that last stat is, um, but the bounce rate for uh, no, I'm sorry, that's a separate thing. The uh, but my point is that based on the numbers that we got advertising in the Kansas City Star, it wasn't that much more than, uh, than putting our, our, changing our paper record from the Gardner News to the, to the Star. So I think it's definitely something to look at because especially when people are bidding projects, they're actually looking at the Star for those projects, so we could actually save a little bit of money. Um, I, I did forget to ask, I'm going to jump here real quick, does any governing body member or their family have a financial interest in Gardner News. I think that's the, on the record, if you wouldn't mind telling no. anybody. Nope. Uh, no. Nope. No. No. The, does anybody or their family member have a financial interest in 136 East Main Street on the governing body? No. 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 Okay. So, um, sorry, that was, I forgot to ask that earlier. So, um, the other thing that was uh, a little troubling to me in the information we got um, down here to it, with the Gardner News. Uh, we currently are paying for advertising on Gardner News. That is the tune of $2,800 a year for marketing for, uh, <clears throat> and I'm guessing it's for the front page advertising on their main page or on all their pages where it has our Gardner logo, which transfers us to the uh, to, it transfers people from Gardner News site to our site. Is that a fair statement, Cheryl? Yes, correct. Right, uh, Tanika? Right, but that, the transfer to the website wasn't the goal of the ad. The goal of the ad was part of the branding. The branding. Right. I, I have a real problem with this because I, I this is one of the things I asked for. I asked for the, the numbers from we're getting from Gardner News to the city's website. We were denied that, so I had Cheryl go back and, and ask our IT department to get it. For a calendar year, we had 200 clicks from Gardner News to the city's website. That's $14 a click that we're paying for advertising, which is 36 cents a click is expensive in today's market. So I, I'm, I'm just going to say, whether we change the paper of record or not, the, the $2,800 as far as I'm concerned is getting wasted. No, I just wanted to you can come up. Okay. Come on up to the. I'm sorry. No, come on up. I just wanted to clarify right. that that's when we placed the ad. It wasn't about the clicks. Right. Um, it was about building, continuing to build the brand. Because when we put the ad in, it was about rebranding. Right. And as you know, with branding, it's about frequency and consistency. We wanted to do it for a year because we had an allocated budget for it. So we wanted to do it for a year and just make sure. If you remember, um, Councilman Ronald, yeah, no, Council I remember. Rich Mountain, we, um, in the branding process, we talked about how we wanted to bring the community together. We wanted to kind of get away from the divided trails. And so this was just a consistent reminder. And I wanted to be able to try that out for a year and then see how we wanted to direct our funds from there. Right. Well, and that's, and I understand that. My, my thing is $2,800 is still a lot for what we're getting, as far as I'm concerned. As a business owner, I can tell you, I, I mean, I do this, 
I look at all these stats on my website, on all the marketing that I do, and we could do Facebook marketing for a hundred bucks every two weeks and beat these numbers. But we also looked at the fact too that on our surveys, it says that most people um, visit the Gardner News. So that's the way we're gonna get the frequency. We can't always guarantee that we get the frequency with Facebook marketing. We could boost and do all those other things as well. But as I said, our primary audience is our residents right. when we first launched our brand. So we wanted to make sure that we were reaching them and getting that message out. Well, again, it was about consistency and frequency. I understand, and but I'm just gonna say still, but the amount of people that are it. looking it's at those pages is not sufficient for that kind of money. We don't have to do right. it. It's just, I'm just, it was just because here's the thing: we should really be offering that up to every business in Gardner. So hey, if you get us a link to the, I'll, I'll do it right now on my my face my web page, and I'll do it on at eight dollars per click, and I'll I'll let you I'll, I'll even bill you. Well, that, I mean, that would be a conflict of interest. <laughs> right. I'm just saying, it's that I'm not the only person that's going to offer that deal up, and some people probably beat me at less than eight. So, right. so anyway, that's uh, any feedback from the rest of the I, 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 I Cheryl Lee, Cheryl's been leaning in for a minute. Okay. The the only thing I would add to what yeah. Danica has explained is, um, for an economic development perspective, you want to have that presence. Um, when a site selector is looking at the area, they're going to look. When you get here to Southwest Johnson County, you're obviously going to look at the city of Edgerton, the city of Gardner. Um, they do have that presence um, online, and so in order to be competitive, all things being equal, you want to make sure that we are also visible and we have that presence. Y your policy decision, but from an economic development perspective, you you want to make sure you have kind of an equal presence. And I just don't see it. Based on the information that we got from them, the limited information <coughs> that, I mean, here's the thing, if I'm, a, if, if I'm a vendor to a company and they call me up and say, give me a reason why, I should continue to do business with you, and your answer is no, I'm not going to give you that information. That's problematic for me. Duly noted. Christina, you had something? Well, I, I mean, I guess I just have a couple of things, and, and I'll be honest with you. I'm kind of with Heath. I'm, I, I just think, I, I think that if we, if we have a, a, a issue with a paper of record specifically, we should be lobbying our state representative to change the fact that we have to have a physical paper of record. But um, I, but the other thing I will say, um, coming to the sur or the surveys, um, you know, I, I don't think it's right that, that we want to sit up here and utilize surveys as a sticking point when it fits our narrative, but then determine that they're not valid for things that don't fit our narrative. So either I think as a governing body, we're going to utilize surveys to try and make decisions, or we're going to say, you know what, we're not going to utilize these surveys because first of all, they may not be statistically valid. And second of all, we know that people can, you know, make multiple requests. So, you know, it, I think it's a good way to kind of gauge the direction of, of people, but I also don't think that it, it's right that we say for fireworks, the survey says this, but for the paper, the survey says that. I mean, that's a fact. Fireworks, you can just look out the window. You well, have to do a but, survey. No, it, it's, I mean, don't use that as the premise then. Let's just say we're not going to do surveys at all. Let's do town halls. That seems to be, you know, a better thing. I just, um, like I said, the other thing I will say is as far as paying or, or doing whatever, I have no issue looking at the best, most effective way to advertise. We have advertising dollars. How are we going to do that? But the other thing is if, if the star is a little bit more, I mean, in by our own purchasing policy, the Gardner News has a 5% buffer to be able to bid on what, whatever it is we decide. So um, I personally, I think this is just, a, I, I just, I have an issue with even spending an inkling of time on it and other than going and looking at maybe why do we even have to have a paper of record to me is a valid conversation i i would yeah I'd, i would almost i'd follow that up with I, is the gardner news even and do we even have um a paper of record that qualifies according to the statute as a paper of record because um I'm reading the statute here, uh, it's 121651 official newspaper in cities of second and third classes qualification. Item number three says more than 50% of the circulation must be sold to the subscribers either on a daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly basis. 
but we've heard numbers here in previous meetings that, and we've seen, a, I, I don't remember exactly the figure. I thought it was 2,000 were printed, 2,000 copies that's, circulated. That's what they told us, 2,000 a, a, a week that they print. Right, 2,000 circulated, and then there, there are 200 subscribers or somewhere in that neighborhood. 230 and change. 230 and change. Which they didn't know. So that's not think. more than 50%. So they, you know, by item number three, and it says that they, you have to meet all of these these following qualifications one, two, three, one through four in that in that statute. Well, I think that I think that Christina makes a good point. <laughs> no paper qualifies as a paper of record right, well, right now. Right, right. So what do we do? What's the point? Do we go to to the to the legal record, which is virtually zilch circulation <laughs> amongst amongst people within the community, but is generally accepted as a paper of record in some municipalities in Johnson County or do we just stay with what we've got and just and just say you know this is a fight that's not worth fighting well, can we stay with what we have if it violates yeah, this you know yeah. I mean it's it's I think we should just stay with what we got I mean I don't think this is a well fight. I'm, a, I'm asking if we if it's legal for us to stay with what we have because the statute is pretty clear well if the legal record is accepted and it's yeah <laughs> yeah you know, ten people maybe even read the darn thing in Gardner, and that's city of twenty thousand. I mean, maybe Ryan? based on <laughs> Lee's thing, we don't have to have a paper of record. Based on that, that we nothing still qualifies. have to have a paper of record. Well, you gotta have a place to, to publish your public notices. Yeah, and and trust me, if you talk to uh, somebody that's with the Kansas Press Association, they can give you a treatise mm. on why it is important to have a third party verification system that is in print. Uh, people have been trying to get rid of, of uh, newspapers as uh, being the publishing source for quite a while now. And uh, those KPA people have it down to uh, lobbying science. Would that be like asking me what's the best holster? <coughs> when you ask a lobbying group? My, what, my, what guess, my, guess, my guess is that you'd pick one be my own that'd be the thing with a lobbying okay. group you know they're they're going to tell you well, that their I, stuff's the best I, I just don't know how much more time i'm and it's it's the majority of the body if it's the consensus of the council that we keep looking that's fine where are we do we want to keep moving forward or do we want to stick with the gardener news as our newspaper of record or do we want to do more looking i mean okay. I, lately, I think you want to do more looking. Christy? I do not. Steve? I don't see a problem in continuing to look, but I don't know if we have a lot of options available to us. I, I don't want to keep looking, no. So, I well, mean, the numbers I've seen in the cost and things, I mean, at this point, I, I don't think we need to keep pursuing yeah. it. That's, it looks like we've still got a majority that wants to keep looking. What's the, so, what were what were the costs we were looking at? I'm, I'm trying to find the email that oh, has that in it. I think what? I have them here because they were not that different. All right. Well, you know, it, we're we're going to keep looking. Can we? Can well, we put that to, off until the, the? Well, it would be good to cover this now because it would, maybe it would help our looking. So here's the column costs on this page. If you want to pass it down to me. I'm going to hate to push something off when we're right here. Right. Do you think that this is going to I don't know, be the but we well, won't know was, until we talk Actually, about the it. reason I'm asking is, is, I, is I can't remember what the cost differences were between the, the options that we were talking about and if I read them right. Talking about line and column? Or, uh, race? Yeah, for line and column. <laughs> I think it was in Laura's email. Is that correct? Your so, yeah, it's summary. 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 Right. so uh, am I reading this right? Gardner News is eleven dollars and fifty cents per inch. Is that correct? That's what they said. Okay, and the Kansas City Star charges six dollars and seventy five cents per inch. I calculated that because their email says it was twenty to twenty four characters a line, nine lines at the end or something like that. So I made that calculation trying to get it apples to apples for you. So the difference between the per inch cost is 
it, it's far more than five. It's significant. <laughs> I mean, it's worth looking at, is it not? I mean, in legal record is, uh, what was that per inch? It's $2.35 $2 per inch. And again, I made that calculation because that's why I included the example that came from the legal record people that they actually charge by the eight and a half by 11 inch page and then they draw lines all over it and figure out how much it is. But I tried to make it apples to apples, it should be is definitely less than the other two. We appreciate your effort there. I uh, do, I do uh, appreciate it. <laughs> it's not easy. So, and it looks like our, our total costs, we're talking about five to $6,000 annually, right? And that's currently. For required publications. And that's spending uh, at a rate of $11.50 an inch. Yes, sir. And we can probably expect those costs to increase as we do more development because more public notices will be generated. Therefore, the, pro the cost should go up. So I guess what I want to know is what would that have cost if we had gone with legal record or, or uh, Kansas City Star? And it seems like it would be significantly less. It seems like we would be somewhere around half or even less than that if we went with a legal record. I mean, just, you can, because I tried to do apples to apples, you can say that, you know, $2 is 20% of 11. I mean, you just round it. So yeah. it, that's why all these other cities use the legal record as their official papers. My responses at the survey were basically, it's almost free. And their entire budget was Nothing and, and so my immaterial. question to the staff is, and to the rest of the council, what are we buying with the additional money that we are spending with the Gardner News? And I would ask that of Heath Freeman as well. What are we buying with that additional 80%? Actually, I would go a step further and say if this is really about getting visibility to people so that they know what's going on, maybe we should advertising all three i mean if, if that is really what this is about is making sure that our people have visibility the gardener residents know where to go to look for information if that's what it's about we should be looking to increase this and advertising all three hey, here's my here's my question though though i think we're we're, we're 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 muddling the waters here because you've got public notices and and le and legally required you know resolutions ordinances those kind of things that have to go out anything that has that requires a public hearing or anything like that that's one group of things that we're paying for all right and that's what you just discussed you know that's how much it costs to put those in the paper and then you've got advertising well advertising is a completely different ball of wax because now you're not talking about public notice you're talking about you know how to get the broadest possible the most number of eyeballs and that really isn't that's regardless of print versus online versus anything. The statute requires we have a written publication of record for public notices. So from that perspective, you, if you narrow it down to that, to that amount, heck, the, the, the legal record is probably the cheapest way to go by far. And, you know, we can continue to advertise in the Gardner News. We can advertise in the Kansas City Star. We could advertise online, Facebook, Twitter, all these other things. But... You know, what we're talking about here is the narrow definition of the paper of record, not all that other stuff. And, and we just had a conversation about people not being notified about something happening with the Board of County Commissioners. Well, that's the county, and, though. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying, thing. though, it's the same concept. Yeah. So if you want to advertise in the legal of record or public notice in the legal of record because it costs less and you have minimal people that view it, then you're you're not you're uh -huh. not solving the problem. I mean, you're you're yeah. making a, a solution. So you to, want the most people for the less, the least amount of money. Actually, I want the most people. Period. I want if I'm in Gardner, I want to know this is where I'm going to go to get my information. I mean, and and like I said, and if it's if it's truly about let's get the word out and make sure everybody has you know visibility to this, then let's advertise in all three. Wow. Or post public record in all three. I don't see that expense as a necessary one, just based on the amount of people that are looking at the one now. 200, 230 people get the paper from, I mean, Gardner News. 
as a subscription in their subscription. mailbox. In their right. mailbox, right? I think a dozen people get right. the, the legal record in their yeah. mailbox. So, but I mean, and versus, <laughs> I think they're all lawyers. I mean, what was that number on there? They, they, they're, I don't know if they're star circulation on there. Or that was just a website. I mean, well, I'm, I'm just looking. At, I'm just looking at sheer numbers here. I mean, we bought 525.9 inches in 2016 at a cost of six thousand forty-seven dollars and eighty-five cents. If we had done it through the legal record, we would have spent one thousand two hundred thirty-five dollars and eighty-seven cents. This is a no-brainer for me. Right. I mean, because we're basically we're just trying to, uh, you know, we're just trying to meet the, the the statutory requirement. We are not. Uh, don't don't kid yourself, thinking that you're you're trying to speak directly to Gardner citizens with this because, you know, I I can you know most people that I know don't read the Gardner News for that. They read the opinion in Gardner News or they read. The, some of the other stuff and the, the, the fun stuff that they write about Rich and me. Um, <laughs> they read that stuff, <laughs> but they don't read it for the public notices. And almost nobody reads public notices. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the bare reality. And, and, also, and also understand this. Our public notices are put out through our, through our website. They're put out through uh, other, other means. Um, the statutory requirement is that we put in a written publication. It doesn't say that's the only place where we can put those public notices. We can put those public notices just about anywhere. Weren't you making the argument that we want it to be like bids and things out there for the most people to see? Uh, well, yeah, I agree on that. We I mean, put all the bid packages bids. online. I want, I want them because here's yeah. the thing: we we got a whole group of people in in the, the you know Kansas City metro who can see bids in the Star to come down here and work. Yeah, we still have the buy local policy where if we have a local contractor who can fulfill that and be within that 5%, we're good. But if somebody else wants to come down here and save the citizens and the tax, you know, the taxpayers money, why not let them? Because they're not getting it if, if it's in the Gardner News, if they live in, you know, we summit as an example. Can I add one thing? Can I add one thing about requests? Uh, you come to the microphone, you, I guess. Mayor and Council, I'm Charlie Brunker. I live in Ottawa, Kansas. Um, I used to do a lot of construction. Any contractor that's doing requests has got a bid list. You can sign up for an email in any mm -hmm. city I and get it through your website. So I sent the city administrator one the other day. That's the most of the time all those contractors are looking right. on websites. You can get in the emails yep. daily than looking at the star. None of us do that right. anymore yeah. or the Gardner News. So all of our full sorry. bid packages are online. Thank you. All of them are on Thank the you. website. Charlie, I appreciate you chiming in. Councilman, let me recognize the speakers from the floor, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little... Yeah. Content. Well, yeah, I know. It's getting to be 10 o'clock, and we've still so, got two executive sessions to go through. Are we moving this on to another meeting? And if so, what is the what other information is it that you're looking for? Or, I, I guess, for first of all, I'd like to find out what the body's position is on the advertising. An advertising? Well, well the, ad, the advertising is being paid out of the uh, uh, Echo the Dev Fund Echo Dev that's by the transient guest tax. That was, it is a separate committee, and that was the decision that the committee made that uh, uh, comes out of that fund exclusively. So we can't give any direction or recommendations to that committee on how they're going to spend that money? Is that? Well, you know, you can have an opinion, but you, you can't, the council can't direct the Economic Development Committee. Right. Well, I'm going to, I guess, recommend money. the Economic Development Committee look at that then. Because okay. I, I mean, I think there's far better uses of that money as far as marketing. So from my personal opinion and my business experience. Okay. So as far as the other, uh, I don't know, where's the rest of the body on this? I'd like to move. I, I'd like to uh, move it to the legal record and save that four thousand eight hundred and eleven dollars and ninety nine cents. Uh, you make a motion. I'll second it. Is that a, is that a um, what's wanna... what's the again? We're talking about uh, yeah. Don't we don't we have to have a resolution for that? We have yeah, to have we a, have we have to have have a resolution. legal resolution. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to have to draft a resolution in any mm -hmm. case because of the fact that this is statutorily right. driven. Okay. So, Do we have consensus of the council to draft a resolution 
switching the paper of record. I'm, I know I get no vote in this, but I'm still no. I mean, it's a, it's I, I a local business. Yeah, there's, it's, I'm it's, a no. The, the statute does provide that the governing body of each city, so you are a member of the governing body. You are. Body. Oh, so, yeah. all right. Okay. Well, in which case, I don't know, 3-3 uh, three, three doesn't have, get you there. 3-3 uh, three, three means the status quo. Yeah. Well, you could, you could sway me if you can tell me what that four thousand eight hundred and eleven dollars and ninety nine cents bought me in twenty sixteen? What did it I, buy I the citizen? This is not our money. This is the citizens' money. That, that that's I mean, this is money we didn't have to spend, and we spent it. I, I just think there's value in in I mean, it's it's our local paper. And like do you Pizza, advertise in that paper? I do not. <laughs> oh, that hurt. I've got my back crack there before he, he, he subscribed. He's, he's all out for me. So, so <laughs> again, I think we need to separate advertising dollars from, from legal notices. Yes. There's a, there's a difference between the two. And statutorily, legal notice is what we're talking about here. We can continue to advertise in the Gardner News. I'm sure we will continue to advertise in the Gardner News, at least for the foreseeable future. But is there a, is there a me? It, to me, I think there's some value in looking at saving some money on our public notices, given the fact that the vast majority of people that want to know something about what the city is doing are going to go to our website. They're not going to go to the Gardner News or the, 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 the Kansas City Star or the legal record, for that matter. Sorry, Brian. But, I mean, it's, it's a little, you know, okay, it, you know, the, the lawyers will read the legal record, and it, and it satisfies the statutory requirements. So, to me, I think it makes perfect sense to save that $4,000 from that perspective. It's, it's almost five thousand. It's almost five thousand. Okay. But I mean but I mean we'll still advertise in the Gardner News and we'll still do business with the Gardner News. There's, that's not gonna change. The Gardner News is our local paper, we'll continue to support it. I just don't see a reason to spend that extra money just to, because they, they they have a Gardner address. Or or uh, yeah, and my and my my thinking on it is we're checking a box for this. We're just checking a box for these legal notices. Mm -hmm. it, nobody's going there for for, for I mean, the average citizen that's paying this additional four thousand eight hundred and eleven dollars is getting no benefit out of this these notices being in the Gardner News. Uh, you know, I, I. You know how many other cities in Johnson County have an actual paper anymore? I don't that care. Has no relevance to I don't this conversation. care. I mean, I, listen, I, you know, I, I'm glad that you're quick to dismiss me when I sat and listened to you make your impassioned pleas. So I didn't if, dismiss if, you. If, if, if you could not interrupt me, it would be greatly appreciated. But uh, you know, yes, our newspaper is dying. Yes, are they dying across the state and the nation? Yes, they are. But we still have one. And uh, you know, whatever, whatever everybody, everybody has their own opinion. Shoot. Uh, I think I, there's probably more than one member of the, the city council up here that would call the Kansas City Star the Kansas City Red Star if they weren't in polite company. So, you know, I, I, I'm for, I, I am for sticking with the Gardner paper to do our legal notices. I, I think I've got two other council members that are with me, and uh, I don't think that either side is swaying the other at this point. I just don't feel like that we, we it, it's a subsidy, is what you're saying, is what we're subsidizing the local paper for our legal notices. Because it feels good. Right. That's what you're saying. Because you you feel no, that, that we need to have this paper. That's, that's what you're saying that I'm saying, and it's not what I'm saying, but that's okay. I just don't know that we need to spend any more time on it. Christina, do you think we need to spend any more time I on it? I do not. Todd? I don't know. Can we move on? Um, I guess. Uh, how do we, how do we resolve this? I think it, I think it just, it just was resolved. Well, I mean, we could, uh, we could. We could have. I, 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 I we mean, could have, here's we the thing: we don't resolution. have a, we don't have a consensus of the governing body, and that's what it's going to take to, to pass uh, this particular reg resolution by state statute. So we are at a, at a draw, which yes. is not going to. We're not going to be able to take any action if that's the way that right. it goes through. I think we are done. Next so, on the list. So because, wait, oh, wait, hang on. 
the, the way to resolve it would be to to put th have us put a resolution together for action, changing what we've done, and then you vote up or up or down. And if you're tied three three, then there's no decisive action. But resolution. Fails. I think we need to do that. That's I think fine we need with to me. Do that. Because I think we need to make sure that everyone knows that there are three of us here that want to spend this four thousand eight hundred dollars, so that because. It's really cool to have a town newspaper and newspapers are dying and all this other, you know, happy frou frou stuff. That doesn't mean a, mean a hill of beans to the person that's having to pay the bill every month on their, you know, on, on their taxes. So there need, that, that needs to be in the in the record. That needs to go. I mean, everybody needs to know that that's happening. I'm fine with that. I'm good with that. Right, we'll bring it forward as a resolution next meeting. Thank you. So my last one. No, it's hard to believe. Still got one more. Um, Laura, are you said the budget is due on August 25th? Is that correct? By statute. Right, by statute. So I, I did some research, um, and I have a question for Ryan real quick. And, and um, this is just some clarification on my end. Uh, is it correct that council cannot direct staff, only the mayor and the city administrator can? Is that correct? Like any, is like if I decide, hey, I, I, I can't tell Danica to go do something with that. I have to go to Cheryl, and she goes to Danica, correct? And the mayor can the mayor can though, interact with staff. So, uh, under under your ordinance, the mayor is still the chief administrator right. off, administrative officer of the city, um, which means he he can provide that direction. Now, what that ordinance provides is that the city administrator. Is there to basically help and assist and coordinate that? Right, and right. he's her. In this instance, she is his employee, not the council's. Correct. So I mean, with what? She, well, I mean, the, I mean, she works for all of us, but primarily so she is his employee. According he, to this, he he, he, he he appoints and then makes recommendations to remove with the consent of the council. Right. Okay. So and then um, let's see. And it is the duty of the mayor and the city administrator, correct, to bring forward a budget for the city to the, the voting members of the board. Well, you have the the governing body has a statutory duty to well, you, you have statutory duties right. to to approve a budget. So, so um, I you know because we don't I don't get to interact with Laura or anybody else, and the rest of the governing body really can't either because we're supposed to go through the sheriff. If you're referring to kind of our past practice, I, I don't know that the, the our ordinances get into the weeds on, okay. on that yeah. kind of stuff. So I'll, I'll ask the rest of my questions here. So in July 13th, 2015, um, we had a budget. Uh, it was a presentation item number three on the 2015, or, sorry, 2015-2016 budget. So that would be July 13, 2015. And then on July 20th, 2015, we had presentation item number one was a public hearing on the proposed 2016 budget. On August 10th, we had a special meeting, and new business item number one is consider adopting a fiscal year 2016 budget. And on July 5th of 2016, we had presentation item number two, which is a 2017 budget presentation. On July 18th, we had a public hearing, number one, uh, that was a proposed 2017 budget, and on August 1st, we had a 2016 uh, new business item, which was considered adopting fiscal year 2017 budget. So, on and just to refresh people's memory, on June 19th, we had a 2017, we had presentation item number four, which is a 2018 budget policy status update, which should have been a work session. I think we all kind of agree on that. And then here it is, August 8th, and we're having a work session on the golf course and I, I I haven't seen any real budget numbers yet and it's kind of disturbing mayor have you seen the budget yet no, any, any other council members seen the budget so I have a real problem with this because here's what I see we're gonna come back and we're gonna have like a week to look at the budget and then we're gonna have to pass it and the citizens don't even have time to see it uh, I understand that there might have been a few issues with the Justice Center but as far as I'm concerned we should have all had individual budget stuff. When was budget due for the staff? When was your budget due, 
Laura. I'm the one that puts the sausage together. I understand. So this is an ongoing process and the we cut this the last thing on the June 19th um, revision was because we did a different process this year. You wanted to do the staffing stuff differently. So then when we put all that staffing stuff in the budget, frankly, the budget broke. Right. So I had to bring it back to you and we cut through the budget again. Mm -hmm. And then I sent you a Friday minute memo that said there basically is no way to do this because I would have to, I can't do two different publications of how the mill levy was going to work out in the so i'm not sure what you're asking I'll be honest with you, i'm not so worried about that as much as i am what we're actually bringing to the table you know there wasn't any hard and fast numbers on anything that any of these staff members requested you know for their budget for 2018 like you know we usually get that breakdown of here's what's needed in this department and this department and this department and that's the way it's you know we were able to look at it line item almost I for uh, uh, in previous years. I'm I'm sorry. Our I, big budget book was about that. Your big budget you book was. Just, there, there's, I, I can get you those pages tomorrow if that's all you want. They're all done. I, I, I'm just wondering why we haven't had it yet. Because until the Justice Center passed, there was more than one version. To because I was going to have to roll back the mill levy if it didn't pass. Right. There were certain exemptions that I was putting the sales tax so the sales tax stream from the courthouse was going to have to move it could have given you other opportunities to use that for other places i was trying to put that sales tax stream in safekeeping if it didn't pass so that you could deal with it next year at this time it's all a time process and the justice center vote other than for me to be presumptuous and publish it in the newspaper one way or the other i'm not asking for publishing it in the well, that's the only, you have to have 10 days between the publication and the public hearing. So I laid that calendar out for all of you in that Friday Minute memo. Right, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, you don't have to publish it 10 days after you give it to us, do you? Anything preliminary you're looking at? We could have had preliminary information up to this point, correct? Uh, you could have had, not until Tuesday morning, no, sir. And we were still making the changes. Right. So, no, I'm sorry, Wednesday morning, following the vote. So now that those pages are done, if you don't care about the analysis and the message, there isn't, I'm hard and fast numbers, I, I don't mean to be argumentative, I'm not sure what you mean. The budget decisions were all made by you January through June 19 in this meeting as a consensus and we took that information and put in what we could till the Justice Center. If you need those pages, we can print those tomorrow and put them in a book if that's all you're interested in and that's perfectly fine and we can keep on writing the rest of the book for your review later if that's all that you need i would love to have that i mean because that any the more information i can get so i can make the best decision possible on that budget I, I'm, I'm all about it so the spreadsheets without any analysis is what you need I, any analysis i mean the budget book is 300 and some pages right and there's a great deal of analysis in the budget message and the financial piece in the in the first 40 some pages there's an analysis of every fund and a comparison of year to year to year trending do and have, do we have something that just breaks down all the departments that are not impacted by the justice center stuff where it says this department needs xyz you know or this is what we're looking at for the 2018 budget there is a spreadsheet for each department and it would just merely be 2016 actual 2017 2017 revised 2018 that would be great they're ready today awesome i look forward to it you want to email or is that something you can email? Uh, it's probably too big right. i think uh, it, if the I'll, I'll wait for the whole budget message myself don't get me started no, that that so, will um, be a while because i i just see what's coming down the pipe <laughs> we're going to have one meeting for the citizens to look at stuff and, and us discuss it and go back and forth and then we're gonna have to pass it that night so i I'm, I'm here to tell you i think we should schedule a couple of special meetings right now so that we have time to look at the budget and, and evaluate it i feel and like that way well we've got, we've got
gone through it throughout the years. We've, yes. Yeah, sir. Here's yeah, we've gone. There's, a, there's yeah. those folks. There's something called some a public time. hearing, and and, and and I want them to have the time to be able to look at it and say, look, this is something we do or do not agree with. This is the this is the concern that I've had in past years, not the last two, but the but the one before that, where we had such a crunch at the end of the budget process that we weren't able to give the citizens enough time to be able to look at the numbers. I have a real problem with the public hearing happening at the same on the same meeting as the approval of the budget. It doesn't give people an opportunity to see how their money's being spent. And and I'm and I I'm not gonna ask for all the deep, deep, you know, spreadsheet stuff like Rich is, but I do have a concern that because of the fact the timeline is so compressed, and I know that it's it's a tough thing because statutorily we were stuck. If we wanted the if we wanted the the, the, the Justice Center voter was going to compress things, but I think that we could have gotten a little bit more preliminary information before now, even if it was just a, a rough guess, or, or or not the you know not not the not the absolute you know dollar amounts to the penny, at least giving us an idea of okay here this is the range that we're looking at in terms of expenditures for each fund. Or, or revenues that we've got and what, what our expected and projected are and what our budget's going to be in the out years. I wish we would have had that. And, and, and that's, that's, that, I think that's all that I was looking for. But, you know, the people of the city are going to be the ones that are not going to have the information in time. We'll probably have it in time. But from the standpoint of publication of the, of the book and getting it out to people and letting them see what the numbers are, it's, it's not giving us much time at all for that. I've done some research, and I, we can actually pass a three-month budget uh, with just the basics and then have plenty of time to evaluate it after the fact. I think this body should look at that just to make sure our due diligence is done. I think uh, that we have to send an entire fiscal year 2018 budget yeah, to, I, to I, the state. I would rather just stick with the process that's been laid out been updated even in Friday Minute Memos. I understand, but for, the citizens for, don't get the Friday Minute Memo. Are they asking you about it? I mean, you can share the Friday Minute Memo with them if you want, want I'm sure. I understand I can do that. That wasn't yes. the issue. Okay, so noted. You aren't happy with the way it went this year. Um, it's a one-off because that hasn't been how it's been. However, sure. in order to solve this to your satisfaction i i can um recap the decisions that you made not necessarily not necessarily in detail i can if you want me to it'll take longer but i can recap the decisions that you made and in what days you made them and sum that all up and tell you what your mill levy is because that'll be in the paper by wednesday anyway i can tell you that right now um because you know it's total 20.544 and all I do is swap from one to the other. I can recap that and then we can print off every page of the spreadsheets that you always get because they are now done. And if that suffices, it can be yeah. um, done by maybe tomorrow night. Yeah, and, I, and I, don't take my criticism as being, you know, obviously there's nothing we can do about it at this point. All right. I know that Rich has made that request for the spreadsheets. That's fine. I don't, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for just getting the, the, the budget book out as quickly as we possibly can so that we can do as much as we can to give these folks due diligence time. But in the future, in future years, and I'm sure this is not going to be the, next, the last referendum we're going to have like this. Right. So we've got to figure out a better way to be able to, to, to you know, keep them informed while at the same time making sure we follow statute. So. All right. So something for Rich. Anybody else want it early? Yeah, I'd like to see it. Okay, something for Rich and Lee. I know. I'll wait for the for the whole book. Me too. I like the budget message. It's a good read. So, what about uh, scheduling some special meetings to go over this stuff? Because well, I don't know how we can schedule a special I, meeting I, until we actually have the the documents. Right. When are we? Going to have that? Just out of curiosity, because it's not going to be the 25th. When when will the um, when will the public notice go in officially, Laura? The notice of public hearing will be in Wednesday's paper. This one's got to be. Yeah. So I, I'm fine with a, a public hearing, or I mean, I'm sorry, a special meeting 
next week if we if you have anything to deliver well that's exactly my question it can't be a public hearing no I, i'm saying no it doesn't need to be a public hearing from my perspective we can have a budget discussion the public can hear it they right. can see it and then it, for the public hearing they can come and weigh in and, at, I, and I, would that that. I would be in favor of that i would be in favor of that if you're ready I'm, I'm fine with something next so week. that's back to the presentation that says here's what you decided yeah here's I, I, it so well i'm about two-thirds of the way through it so i suppose i can do that by next monday so you would hear Well, uh, check your check your schedules. Make a suggestion. Okay. I'm fine with a special yeah, meeting to have to go over the budget numbers before the. the, the if we can look at it and poll, meeting. that way we can. That'd be great. Because I, I mean, see. the more time we can give us and the citizenry, we, we owe the citizens that. So. And and when you say look at the numbers, to me, I'm not sure what that. What are you looking for me to bring? Because that's not generally what I bring you. I bring you a message that says, "Here's the things you decided." And that's, there's no talk about I numbers. About. Right. I care about, I mean, I, I, personally, I feel like we've kind of done this throughout the process. I get it hasn't been all summarized yet, but um, I, I would, I think providing a summary, hey, here's, here was the discussion, here's the positions we initially wanted all included, here's everything that we removed because we couldn't afford it. Um, just that summary in a special meeting and It'll be televised and people, Any, when they come to the public hearing, will have a chance to have been yep. educated. Anything that maximizes transparency of the process, I'm in favor of. And that would, Period. if I give you the same presentation again on the official public hearing as required by law with the 10 days between publication, and you, you can sleep through it, I guess, but the people who would be right. here officially for the public hearing, oh. it would be the exact same public hearing. Right. Well, then... You'll be really good at it, Mike. I'll be really good at it. Right. <laughs> That's fine. And you want the spreadsheet? Yes, please. And so does Lee. So, we well, like spreadsheets. I love spreadsheets. All right. <laughs> so, uh, I, and then uh, my last thing is uh, Monday, next Monday, we have a going to be super awesome meeting for the Citizens Police Advisory Committee where we're going to, like this, where Steve stole my thunder, um, we're going to talk about. Um, <laughs> interaction between intergovernmental agencies. So I reached out to the Sheriff's Department, uh, and the Fire Department, Fire District, um, and we're gonna talk about uh, emergency uh, communications and things that happen with our commercial buildings and how we get everybody on the same page with what happens in an event because there hasn't been a lot of that. And, and the goal is, uh, is to eventually kind of move this um, to where in all reality, the intermodal and the proximity of it if anything happens, our first responders are going to be there before everybody else's. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to move it where we can help Edgerton again with the intergovernmental cooperation and have all that information in a file for if we have to respond to something, we have the information. Our guys have the information we need. I, I, I swear that we didn't talk about this. <laughs> so that that is uh, because it is a potential threat over there. So yeah. So anyway, that, that is it for me for council updates. Appreciate you guys all staying. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, I'd like to say that I'm happy that the uh, bond issue passed for the Justice Center. I want to thank Chief Pruding, anybody on the staff there that participated in helping give people um, tours uh, or any public information. Nico Marshall of Kendo, and if not mm -hmm. for all the great information that you pushed out, yeah. I don't think that this uh, would have gone through quite so easily. Yes. Uh, you're to be lauded and applauded. Thank you to the governing body for whatever, wherever you were able to place a little uh, weight behind the issue uh, when you did it. I'm sure that the, the people at Gardner Police Department all appreciate it, uh, but I think this is a, a, a very good thing uh, for us going forward. Uh, Lee, you mentioned that uh, that community center. I've heard that community center talk for a long while, uh, and 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 you know I don't think it's ever going to be 
something that we can expect to see happen if somebody doesn't make it a priority. So uh, we'll see what happens there. We've got executive session scheduled. Uh, and the first one, Ryan Dank, how long are we going to need? Uh, <clears throat> I only need five minutes, but I might suggest that we reconvene in 10 to give people a chance to run to the restroom or whatever before we head back. Okay. All right. All right. So I, uh, I entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session. Uh, second, I believe, is the recess. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Motion shoots, I mean, motion, on, shoot second Harrison. Motion Harrison, second shoot that we enter executive session pursuant to attorney client privilege for the purpose of discussing pending litigation, leaving at 1021, resuming regular session at uh, 1031. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. We stand in recess. Entertain a motion to resume regular session. Second. Second. Sh uh, shoot, uh, Melton second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 We are back in regular session. Uh, entertain a motion to uh, recess into executive session. Second. Motion Harrison, second. Should we enter into executive session to discuss personnel matters relating to non elected personnel? Sharon, you need 20? We'll start with 20. Uh, uh, so, uh, adjourning, uh, well, recess, entering into recess at uh, 1032, coming back at 1052. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any objection? We stand. Regular session. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Uh, we are back in regular session. I would entertain a motion to recess into executive session. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, motion shoots second. Harrison, that we enter into executive session to discuss personnel matters relating to non elected personnel uh, going out at uh, 10 50 two and coming back at uh, 11 12. all those in favor indicate by saying aye aye opposed any abstention we stand in recess yeah sergeant ben says he's got 11 12 on his watch so i'm going to say uh, uh would we uh, uh i would entertain a motion to second resume regular session shoot and Harrison, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, we're back in regular session. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion Harrison, second winners that we adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. So, uh, there's just a small thing, you know. I have to stop